Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We're about to start the open consultations, the community section. We had the first day of the MAG meeting yesterday. We're going to have the second day tomorrow, and today is the open consultations. I was about to call out names. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, just before we start, as usual, if you weren't here yesterday, please, we are using the speaking queue. And also, when you start, can you please say your name um, clearly and slowly for the scribes so that the scribes can catch it? Uh, thank you very much. Um, of course, we are being webcast and uh, transcription, which is going to be made available on our website later on today. And of course, the summary report is going to be produced, which will be available next week. Um, with that, let me just give hand over the floor to our chair, Lynn. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, today is the Open Community Day. And we, the MAG made a decision um, a little while back to move that around for two reasons. We were hoping, actually hoping that we could draw some additional participation in from the WISIS participants. Um, yesterday was the opening day, and we didn't want to compete with that. And then also, um, this meeting was largely focused on trying to have some uh, discussions around some more strategic topics. And um, we wanted to um, spend some time within the MAG doing that, come into the open community day, hear from the community, and. Um, if we had made any progress on day one, um, share some of that progress or kind of emerging <coughs> thinking with the, with the community. And we will do that over the, the course of the day. Um, the very first item, of course, is to uh, approve the agenda. So the agenda has been posted for some time. We made one slight edit yesterday. It was always intended, but we just wanted to make it more clear that in, um, certainly with the community discussion agenda item, that is the community discussion. It really is the opportunity to hear from the community, and the MAG is in a listening mode. Um, later in this session, if someone can scroll up or down on the agenda there, we actually have some presentations from uh, best practice forums and some of the dynamic coalition. And we're asking everybody to keep those presentations to a minimum so that we save half of the time, 30 minutes in that one hour slot for um, community, community discussion. Um, that is the only substantive, well, actually, there is one other change. At 5 o'clock, we will actually have a presentation from a representative from the uh, UN Secretary General's high-level panel on digital cooperation. Um, that will be here um, in this room as well. So let me see if there are any um, suggestions uh, for changes to the agenda or any additional items under AOB. I'm looking in the queue to see if there are any online participants that want to comment as well as um, in the room here. If not, I'd like to call for approval of the agenda twice. <laughs> okay. We'll call the agenda approved then. And the first order of business is a, a few um, welcoming um, comments. I will save mine um, to the end and combine that um, with a short introduction to the morning session. Um, but first start by introducing Denise Cesar from Endesa. Um, he is with us for the entire meeting here. Of course, Dessa is the um, institutional home within the United Nations for the IGF. So Dennis, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'll, I'll be very brief. Uh, good morning, everyone, and especially uh, Thanks to uh, non-MAG members if they are attending the open consultation session, and that's for you. Uh, I can just say two things, maybe. Uh, for the, as you know, DESA is the institutional home to the IGF. We are the link between MAG, MAG chair, secretariat, and the uh, SG's office. Uh, we are here to listen uh, about the. 2020 MAC, uh, we hope to start the MAC renewal process as early as possible to give you sufficient time. 
Uh, and also for the 2020 host, uh, we would like to also announce it uh, as early as possible, hopefully during the third MAG meeting. Uh, let me just also thank to Germany again for uh, hosting us, uh, and uh, I wish you a good meeting. Thank you, Dennis. Um, the next set of comments is from Dr. Daniela Brunstrup, who, of course, is the honorary host co-chair um, of IGF 2019. Daniela, you have the floor. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you also, Dennis. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, yes, I, I try to be brief as well because um, um, I have told you last time already how proud Germany is to be the host country 2019. We are making good progress, I think, in uh, organizing the uh, event, but there's not yet the full agenda of uh, day zero. We are still working uh, on that, of course. But uh, you will be aware that Chancellor Merkel in particular campaigned from the very first beginning for the IGF and uh, she has decided to come for the opening in November. Um, Germany's aim is, as the host country, to increase the relevance of the IGF by strengthening on the one hand the multi-stakeholder approach that is very important in our view and that means also to getting really everybody and all stakeholder groups on board. And we are trying to give more awareness also to the IGF. And um, our impression is in inviting high level people and providing a discussion room for them on day zero, this could be an opportunity to get also more media coverage. Another issue is how to get more tangible outcomes. Um, that would be helpful also for decision makers, but um, on the other hand, also for the broader public. Um, we will try to make, or uh, to help, I mean, the Secretariat in um, marketing for the outcomes of the IGF and to bring them to the broader public. The IGF should be the place to discuss all internet-related issues. And our aim is to bring the world to Berlin because the world should have the understanding that this is the place to discuss those issue, issues this year. And also to be part of the discussion how we would like to see the internet for the next decade. But the community, and I think that is all of us, we have a responsibility as well. We have the resp responsibility to submit fruitful, interesting, innovative session proposals and as a MAG, we have the responsibility to have and to choose and design an interesting, thought-provoking program. To make sure that the work we are doing is sustainable and meaningful, we should take responsibility also of the resources. And that is the point I would like to raise today. Um, you probably know that um, the IGF has a mandate until 2025 uh, but resources to really have a sustainable work are not yet fixed. So um, we would like to also give more sustainable planning for the IGF work, and um, I, ca I call here for donors. That could be a very good signal in Berlin if we could have a sustainable way and financing for the IGF work until 2025. We have the vision of a really global, inclusive internet. Uh, so our motto for 2019 would be one world, one web, one vision, shaping together the future of the net. I'm looking very much forward to the discussion today and I'm, I'm here to listening to the community, what they expect from Berlin and uh, what input they can give. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniela. Um, so I'm just going to say a, a few words to kick um, this discussion off. And I actually just saw a tweet pop up on my phone <laughs> from Samantha. Apparently, evidently, I said Open Community Day as opposed to Open Consultation Day. But um, no, there is no intentional name 
changing or potential exercise or anything. It's it's um, just day two slip of the tongue. Um, so what we wanted to do with this particular session, um, we're fortunate this year in that with the timely appointment of the MAG and the MAG chair, we actually have had additional program time, um, additional time in all of our activities to develop the program, but also to um, take a look at some of the um, more strategic areas we're calling them. Um, frankly, the genesis of a lot of those discussions were the various improvement exercises that have actually happened um, over the course of the last few years. So they drew upon um, activities such as a CSTD working group on IGF improvements, DESA retreat of a few years ago, all of the stock taking exercise that happens through the IGF um, community and, and its processes. And the MAG had established um, a couple of working groups over the last few years. Um, one is the working group on IGF improvements, um, which actually looked at those activities I mentioned and others as well. Certainly the WISIS plus 10 is another, is another input and tried to assess how we were doing against uh, both categorize those suggested improvements and evaluate both how we were doing against them and where um, they should be directed if in fact there was sort of insufficient activity against them. And um, it's been a tremendous amount of work for that working group. Um, they've done a, a tremendous job and part of the discussions that have come into the MAG over the last two years is as a result of that working group work. A second um, uh, working group was a working group on multi-year strategic work program. And that specifically um, was focused on whether or not there was um, a small number of critical strategic activities that the MAG might take a longer term view of, um, both so that we could actually advance the work, particularly um, in past years when in fact there's been quite a gap between one MAG and the next. We were losing a lot of time and a lot of momentum. So that was actually meant to kind of help bridge that gap. It was actually meant to support um, a, a kind of more better transition between the two MAGs, um, uh, not to give us a, a sort of loss of momentum in our activities. And having a longer horizon, um, we thought that would actually allow us to identify other potential partners that we might um, outreach to to engage in the work, um, certainly to enrich the work itself, but also potentially to increase some um, funding and some support to the to the IGF. So that is a discussion um, the MAG had yesterday and one of the things we would be interested in hearing from the community on today if that works, if not we'll be um, writing this up and getting it out to the, the community over the coming coming week or so is um, whether or not there's support for that program and then as the conversation advances if there was support um, what some of the topics might be. But let me just try and be, be a little bit more clear on this because we had some discussions yesterday. This is not a full multi-year program for the work of the IGF. This is basically taking some of the learnings from a couple of the best practice forums, um, notably I think the cybersecurity and the major policy initiative we've had running for four years, which was the connecting and enabling the next billions um, activity. Um, in fact, every one of the BPFs we have today and I think have always had, have always seen their work in a multi-year fashion. We're going to do this as a first phase and we would consider this as a second and third um, phase. So um, what that allowed some of the BPFs to do, again, was to um, be really thoughtful about the work they were doing, pull in additional uh, potential um, partners. And we're actually wondering whether or not those activities could be strengthened or improved, perhaps stepped up. Maybe they fill the bill. Um, maybe we take one or two strategic topics, identify them as strategic topics, set some um, sort of multi-year goals in terms of what we'd actually like to advance or accomplish within those topics, which would then allow us to um, engage more broadly. Certainly engage more broadly across the existing IGF ecosystem with all of its intersessional activities and certainly um, with the NRIs if and, and, and when they choose to, um, as well as outreach to additional partners um, as well. Um, so that's one, one um, sort of concrete uh, path um, the MAG would like to pursue. Um, we had a very long discussion on outputs. 
Um, are the outputs adequate? Are they sufficient? Um, are they reaching the audiences they need to reach? Do we know what the audiences are we're trying to reach? Um, uh, you know, that sort of thing. So those were the two um, key points in the discussion yesterday. We can revert back to those um, if the, if, um, the community wants. Um, we can certainly, um, you know, debate that a little bit more or, or discuss or, or um, uh, discuss it here or anything else that the community actually thinks is important for the IGF to take up. Again, we, we tried to leave this um, a little bit loose, um, partly because just the set of process with a really global um, set of players um, from all multi-stakeholders, really diverse and um, not, um, you know, we don't have the systems in place that really kind of support an ongoing dialogue that you can develop fully with the community, that we would leave it open and um, ask for the community in terms of what do they think some of the strategic priorities or strategic um, kind of development areas ought to be for the IGF community. So I will um, leave it there um, and go to the queue to see if there are any any thoughts. Um, again, at one point we can have a, a discussion on areas that the community thinks are important. If people have experiences or activities they want to share that they think are, are, are sort of informative for the IGF, given our focus on um, trying to improve outputs, um, trying to um, build and pull in additional participants. You know, we were very cognizant yesterday of the Secretary General's comments about um, pulling in additional um, types of participants. I think it was philosophers and social scientists. And, um, and of course, we also have um, uh, you know, questions about the UN Secretary General's high-level panel on digital cooperation and um, what that is considering and what it might be addressing. Um, clearly, I think there are some people that see that as um, implying, these are not the best words, but I have to say I'm a little winded already and it's only day two, <laughs> implying that, you know, the IGF is not filling um, the full set of needs that the community worldwide see. So if that's a true statement, are there things um, we need to step up on? Are there things we need to to address? I don't want to keep talking until there's somebody in the in the queue, so I'm actually going to stop for a minute and give people a minute to think and see if see if they want to to come in. And the whole reason for the speaking queue, I can appreciate that it you know, it seems like an extra step is that it's meant to really level the playing field between those um, individuals that are participating online and those that are physically here in the room. It really does give a level playing field, assuming the AV technology works well enough. Part of the problem might be, well, one, I haven't been able to get <laughs> online into the chat room to see who's actually participating remotely. Um, that's my computer's problem, not an AV problem. But when I look around the room here, what I see are an awful lot of mag faces um, and not a lot of, um, I don't like the word non-mag, but not a lot of faces of those individuals that aren't from, from the mag. So I think it's a fairly small set at the moment we're trying to draw from here in the room. Eve? Yves Mathieu. Yes, good morning. Uh, I take this opportunity to, um, I have what, three minutes? Um, to, to make a presentation um, that would be one of the answers to your call for um, momentum and support to the uh, ways that the dialogue could happen inside the uh, IGF. So with um, uh, the support of the German governments, ISOC, UNESCO, Wikimedia, the European Commission and other organizations, we propose to organize by the end of uh, September um, a global dialogue with day-to-day -day citizens about the future of the Internet. And this dialogue would happen in 60 to 100 countries People would meet face to face. This would not happen uh, uh, on the web. It would happen in a room with ordinary people 
selected for representing the diversity of their country or the city where they live in. And during a full day, they would uh, have a discussion, a conversation about what is the value of Internet for them today, what are their fears about Internet, how do they see the future of the Internet in their life, in their community, globally. And this conversation would be organized under the same format everywhere on the planet. That means that uh, during the IGF 2019, we could feedback the result with our partner, could feedback the result of this conversation. And this conversation could be uh, an help to define the agenda of IGF 2020 and following, as it might give uh, a vision to you as partner to the IGF stakeholder, a view of what are the the key points seen by the citizens as the points to be preserved, because it's very important for them, solved. And um, from the discussion that we would have in Berlin, we could also identify dead angles in what they say that could be also uh, a way to, to set up the agenda. And so um, in the coming months, you will hear more about this initiative. We are finalizing the the, the support of partners to make it possible. And uh, we are uh, ha having discussions to see how this will be presented during the, the D0 in particular uh, in Berlin. So if you have any suggestion for this citizens dialogue, please come to me during uh, the day. And uh, to give you an example, we just did that for the French government. You may have heard that uh, the President Macron decided to have a conversa an open conversation with French citizens in the last two months, 1.5 million people in France took part to this conversation. And uh, Mission Public was in charge of uh, the last batch of this, uh, this conversation. <coughs> There's been 10,000 meetings in France in two months. And we were in charge of the organization in the final week of the debate of 21 debate with ordinary citizens uh, that happens everywhere uh, in all regions of France. And it lasted one and a half day. And it was interesting to see that uh, when we talk with the people about the future of France, they also address the question of future of the Internet. And uh, so I just want to add one comment about this. And in the result of this conversation with day-to-day -day citizens in France, including overseas, in fact, people paid a lot of attention to uh, what Internet allows, in particular to the increased efficiency of the states and how the public service has provided. But there is a, a very strong demand to keep a human face in the Internet. And in all the regions, there has been suggestions to the governments, and I think that this has been heard by Prime Minister, we presented the result last Monday, that people want to have a, a, a faster dematerialization of the procedures. They want it to, they recognize that it's a strong help for the citizens but they want it to happen without excluding the people who have difficulties with the web. And so they are not happy at all with the way it is done today, and they urgently ask the government to put a human face to that and to be in a position of not only dematerialization of the state, but also to be with the citizen in this, uh, in this aspect and to avoid that Millions of people who now have difficulties to have access to Internet uh, are left behind this uh, uh, new form of public services. And so um, it's very interesting. I will share a, a summary of that um, with you. Um, and uh, this is what we want to do at the global scale, focusing on the future of Internet. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eve. Um, appreciate you breaking the ice here <laughs> and, and jumping in. I mean, this is a discussion for the community. So if anybody wants to come back in and, and you know, explore that a little bit further with Eve in terms of where it might fit or not fit or suggest something else or uh, questions for the MAG. Um, you two, are you in a non-MAG capacity? Um, yes, in that case. It's a non-MAG. I have a question to Eve. Um, 
in the light of the fact that one third of internet users worldwide is under the age of 18 and in my capacity as a child rights activist i would like to ask whether you have plans to have also particip participants in the debates that are under the age of 18. thank you um. I take this as a suggestion. <laughs> so we, it is something that is, uh, of course, desirable, strongly desirable. So I fully understand uh, your point. The fact is that it raises legal questions uh, to have uh, young people around tables uh, being recruited. To tell you, um, with the procedure with the French government, we organize a group spe specifically focusing on youth um, and uh, we put the limit of age at 18 be because of the legal reasons, uh, because there are uh, aspects of authorization from parents and so on. But this being said, uh, the only way to do it is to partner with organizations which have already uh, access to the youth and who act with the youth. And these organizations can, of course, be part of the uh, the partners to the debate and that's the way that I would suggest to do so um, this is a call that I launch uh, if uh, you have such an organization that can give access in some countries or in globally to uh, groups of young people that would be part of the debate because they will understand perfectly well the questions they have of course right answers as well and this is an excellent suggestion and I would really be happy to add this as an option to the organization of this global citizens debate. So if we can have a further conversation, if I understand well, this is a, a door that you could open and make it easy to have access to young people, correct? So thank you very much and let's continue this. And if there are other people that can offer this possibility, we, we take it. Thank you. Thank you, Eve. Uh, we have Marilyn Cade. Marilyn, you have the floor. Marilyn's participating remotely, so I'm not sure if we actually have AV in the room or people need to read the transcript or. Marilyn, just a second if you can hear us. I think we're trying to get the process working in the room here. There's a, do we need to come back to Marilyn? Yes, please, let's, let's see if we can just contact with her later. Okay. N Marilyn, with, um, with apologies, and we've now got several processes going here in the room. Uh, her comments in the chat. Um, okay, so Marilyn, let me see if this um, asks what your presenting. Apologies, sincere apologies for the, the difficulties here with the, the AV in the room. Uh, Marilyn's saying, can the present speaker please provide his name and contact information for remote participants if some are not in the room and cannot approach him in person? Uh, it's a very good point. So it was um, Yves Mathieu, um, and maybe the... I don't know if you really want to give your email out in a public way like this, but maybe um, through the secretariat or something or? Yes, we will share in the chat, yes. Okay, that's a good way. Thank you. And Marilyn, if there is, um, if you want to come back in on something else, we'll continue to work the AV in the room. And in the meantime, I'll go to the next person in the queue, which is Rajesh. Rajesh, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Uh, very good point raised by Eve, and I really support that. As just I want to put the information to Eve that in India, we are doing especially with the school children, because m majorly the online child abuse comes from the school side due to their non-awareness or non-education. 
they are doing this from the online thing and to stop this we want to uh, block this complete thing from the user side ki that none of the school ch children indulge into this type of thing wherein internet gets abused thank you rajesh uh, next we have raquel in the queue raquel Thank you very much, Lynn. Um, just for a full disclaimer, I'm a MAG member, but I'm speaking in my capacity as a representative of Internet Society. Um, first of all, I'm not reacting. Um, we, we do support Global Citizen, and it's an amazing project. I do um, encourage everyone to, to know more about it. Um, but my remarks now are more um, related to the open question uh, that we have. Where do we see the, the IGF fitting, right? And um, um, we do appreciate the efforts that are being made. Uh, you know that Internet Society has been pushing for the improvement of the IGF, uh, for certain change that needs to be made and needs to be made urgently. And uh, we really appreciate the efforts that are being made by UNDESA, by the IGF Secretariat, by the IGF Chair, and by the MAG, of course, uh, that uh, are taking up on some of those improvements. Um, for example, we now have the focused program into the three tracks, uh, the multi-stakeholder we are going to discuss, but the multi-year approach uh, the program and so on. Uh, and those are really needed steps to, to make this um, a stronger IGF process. Uh, but uh, one of our concerns is also that uh, we still need to go beyond and there is work to be done to make it much more simpler, much more focused, uh, and uh, to make sure that it can reach uh, many of the developing countries. One of the things that also uh, the IGF has in terms of its format and the way it's organized, it's very expensive. And if we can make sure that we can bring this to a more simpler format, to a more simpler requirement, it can also um, be hosted by uh, more developing countries. That's on the operational, let's say, part. On the substantive part, um, the other concern uh, in terms of the agenda is that this is not the everything governance forum. Um, we need to go back to the roots of what is the internet and um, what is important. Uh, if we recall, the internet is this uh, global networks of networks, right? That those are communications networks that connects itself and uh, apart from being open and interconnected, and uh, there is also the other layer. It's a multi-layer um, format. And so the applications that we know today, for example, Google, Facebook, I don't want to pick on them, but <laughs> it's not. It's the, the interface that we see is not the internet per se. Those are applications on top or uh, uh, connected to the internet. So sometimes we do see this confusion on the content, the web layer and the, the internet layer. Um, and if we really want to be the internet governance forum, we need to consider these uh, nuances and uh, we need to protect the internet. There are certain threats that can uh, bro break it break the internet that we know today. And this is a concern that I, uh, I believe the, the, the forum as itself uh, needs to, to pick up. Thank you. Oops, thank you, Raquel. Is Marilyn um, able to come in and looking for the floor again? Marilyn, I'm just looking to the AV support here in the room to understand the situation. Lewis. It seems, I mean, uh, we are seeing their, their waves, so probably she is speaking, but it is not arriving to here. So we will check if it's only from her or if it's other participant, otherwise we will fix this later. Okay. Later. okay? Um, Sorry for this. Marilyn, um, again, I mean, I'm assuming you heard that. Um, we're not able to hear you in the room here. I don't know if you want to wait and try and come in later or if you want to send your comment in in the chat and we'll get someone to, to read it out. I will ask somebody to look at that in the background while we continue. Uh, the transcription service can hear her, and so she could at least uh, talk.
booked us via the transcription. Um, so it, I mean, that might give oh, a clue okay, to excellent. the. Okay, excellent. Great. That's yeah. good. So that's something. No, that's good. I, I wasn't actually looking up high enough to see the transcription. Excellent. So Marilyn, um, if that's okay for you, if you can um, speak, and we'll we'll follow through the transcription. Thank you. Marilyn, thank you. Just so you're clear, the sound just came in at the room um, on your last like ten words or something, which is what the um, you know the, the chuckle was in in the room. Um, I want to thank you for your suggestions. I think they're very very good, very helpful. And if I could ask um, Daniela um, and Isa, there's something else you want to say um, for the uh, the streaming. If you can just kind of encapsulate the question you're responding to. Otherwise, if people are actually watching the streaming later, they're going to see three minutes of silence with all of us just <laughs> staring at the screen. So I'd put the, put the response into context. If you can just verbally include the question, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn, and also thank you, Marilyn, for asking the question about uh, how we're making sure that we will have high-ranking people from really all stakeholder groups, and especially from uh, smaller and medium-sized companies um, from uh, non-industrialized countries. Um, in fact, I'm, I'm really uh, thankful for, for the question because uh, we are um, trying to reach out for the relevant uh, stakeholder groups uh, by addressing those who we know. But uh, in fact, uh, please contact me or Rudolf Kriedel um, 
uh, in suggesting whom we should uh, also address. Because we are really open, we try to be as representative as possible. Uh, so in that sense, uh, just contact us and we will then get in touch uh, with those people. Especially, you know, as a, a governmental representative, um, uh, the civil society to be represented, uh, to make sure that they are represented in, in an, um, yeah, adequate way is for us probably the most difficult task. Um, concerning small and medium-sized uh, businesses, I mean, we have reached out to um, the, yeah, the, the business communities we know, but we are really thankful for all other input we get. So please contact us. And then there was a question on um, when uh, rooms will be available uh, at day zero. Effectively, I would like to hand over to Cengata because right now I do not <laughs> have the answer. <laughs> Thanks. Yes, uh, the question for the room design, um, it really depends on what kind of requests that we get. So if we get requests for a certain type of rooms, then we can um, get all these requests together and then we can find, find out that, yes, okay, we need three rooms with round table, you know, four rooms, theater style. So that would be basically, uh, we may be able to tell you end of June. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. At the earliest, yeah. Thank you, Daniela Changatai, and again, Marilyn. Thank you for the the um, really helpful suggestions. So, anyone else in the queue? New topics? Um, anything you'd like to see some part of the IGF ecosystem doing? Um, either something new, something different, um, improvements. I'll just do a minute to see if anybody else comes in, and if not, um, I can see if there's support for going back to the two um, significant topics that the MAG actually addressed yesterday. But, Eve, were you looking for the floor again in response to? You have the floor. Yeah, thank you, Lynn. I, I just want to answer to Marilyn that, yes, we will connect with the regional IGFs uh, for their autumn sessions, autumn from the north. Uh, yes, we will do that, of course. It's very important to be connected with them with this uh, global citizens debate. And it will be also interesting in 2020 to have discussions inside the regional IGF with the lessons learned from the dialogue with the citizens, as it will be possible to see if some regions have specific expression from citizens, or if it is really transversal and if the message are the same from Africa, islands, Asia, Americas, and so on. So that will be a matter that we will, it's not really a study, it's more a material that we will m make available to all the stakeholders that will want to refer to the say of ordinary citizens about the vision of the future of the internet. Thank you. That, thank you, Eve. Uh, Paul, you have the floor. Thank you and good morning. It's Paul Blaker from the UK government. Uh, I'm not a member of the MAG, but I did observe the meeting uh, yesterday. Uh, and I'd like first to thank the host and also thank the MAG for holding this open meeting today. Um, and I'll give a few reflections, if I may, on, on, on the meeting yesterday and the, and the discussions that we had. I think this discussion is very timely. Uh, and I was struck yesterday when Japan reminded us of the mandate, the very ambitious mandate that the IGF has. Uh, and I think there is more for the IGF to do in order to fulfill that mandate. I, I agree with what our co-chair said earlier today. The IGF should be the place where people come to discuss internet issues globally. And uh, perhaps uh, if the IGF was fulfilling its mandate perfectly, then we would not need to have a high-level panel on digital cooperation, and we would not see so many proliferations of other forums. Um, so this is a really critically important conversation. I think we really welcome the work that the MAG is doing to address these issues. 
Um, I think we all understand the challenges that the IGF faces, especially in terms of funding uh, and capacity. Uh, the support staff do a really amazing job with very small resources, and we're really grateful to them for everything they do. Um, the UK is able to donate a small amount of funding. I wish it was more. And we're very grateful to all of the donors, and particularly this year to Germany, of course. But we do need to attract more donors. We do need more capacity, and, and we need to keep making that call. But even within the capacity and the budget that we have, uh, there is more that uh, we can do to strengthen the IGF. And there were three points yesterday uh, that struck me in particular. Uh, the first one is, yes, about doing more to identify and disseminate IGF outcomes. I think in the UK government, we would absolutely agree that the IGF should not be negotiating recommendations or resolutions. Um, its strength is its diversity. But we should be able to capture better the key conclusions of the IGF. Uh, sometimes there may be disagreements, and, and that's OK. Uh, we might identify an issue which needs more discussion. But when I come home from the IGF and someone asks me, oh, what did the IGF say about connecting the unconnected? What did it say about cybersecurity? Or I, I need to be able to answer that question. Uh, and, and that means we do need to be uh, thinking more about how we identify the key conclusions that the IGF comes to. And then secondly, as people discussed yesterday, uh, we need to think about how we tell that story. Um, the IGF is not a corporate body. It doesn't have one view. It's a forum with different views. But we do need to use media, particularly social media, to communicate what the IGF is, what it's doing, what it's saying. Uh, much more clearly. And there was a, a really good idea yesterday, I thought, about including somehow in the criteria for workshops an element of how the workshop would contribute to dissemination or communication. Uh, I think that's really important and should be looked at um, more carefully. Um, and then a third area uh, was the importance of shaping the program. Uh, and yes, the IGF is bottom up, and it should continue to be so. But the MAG has got a really important role in facilitating a coherent program and a coherent story. Um, and again, there was a, a, a good idea yesterday, I thought, about having some main sessions at the beginning of the week to set out the, the agenda and the issues and the topics, then some workshops that were looking more detail at those, and then main sessions at the end to try to draw together the different strands, the different threads, and weave them into a coherent conclusion and a coherent message that can then be communicated to the outside world. I think we would strongly support that. Um, one idea or area that was not discussed quite so much yesterday uh, was the uh, national and regional initiatives, I thought. And I think perhaps there is more potential uh, here um, uh, to, to give them a higher profile at the global IGF. Uh, to allow them uh, better ways to, to report back, if you like, on the concerns and the issues from their regions uh, to, to, at a global level. If we really want the IGF to be bottom-up, to be really connected to people's issues in different parts of the world, uh, we need to think about how we can use those national and regional initiatives at the global IGF in order to keep that connection uh, and that relevance. Um, so. Uh, finally, uh, as I say, I think we really appreciate how the GAC is dealing with these issues. It's really good to see how, how Germany is planning to uh, take some of these issues forward uh, in Berlin. Uh, and, and my question, if you like, is how can we step up the pace of this work and, and make sure that we are uh, not just talking about it, but actually taking action at the next IGF and, and beyond? Thanks. Thank you, Paul. I think that was a very useful set of comments and a, and a partial summary of the discussions yesterday. So appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Marilyn, you have the floor. <laughs> Sorry, just uh, one more minute.
Sorry, Lewis is doing double business here. The ITU AV support had stepped out of the room just for a minute, so he's now running over to try to work that angle as well. Oh, I think we might hear you. Marilyn, can you try speaking? ISOC about the continued um, interest of ISOC in the hold on I think I think this think is, this is not is this working yeah. is this working now Okay, okay, go ahead. No, it's really not, Marilyn. Um, if you can keep speaking, the scribes are doing a great job of capturing it. Thank you. Okay, okay. So, so as, as I, I said, said, I appreciate the comments that I saw made, made about, about uh, the continued evolution and improvements of the um, of the IGF, and I think. We do have to continue to focus on how we find better ways of packaging the work we're doing. And I, Dennis, I, I know you have, we've had this conversation before and you've been very thoughtful about the um, need for us to find um, ways to create better looking publications. Um, text only is not the, uh, most effective way to convey messages to high level or um, everyday people. So figuring out what a strategy is to have the funding to have a um, professional editorial service during the time of the IGF itself I think is something that we should continue to try to evolve toward. I am going to make a, a comment, however, about I think something that that we overlook and do not not use. I um, I heard Paul uh, find funding to be able to attend and participate actively in the IG is also an ongoing objective. But one thing that we have as an asset and do not use very effectively is the village. I recall that the village, when we were in Sharm el Sheikh, was toured by um, the president's wife, and media followed her from booth to booth providing a great opportunity for additional coverage of what was going on and opening new comments and discussions about um, the village. I think we need to look back at Brazil and Mexico as uh, examples of the setup for the booth that really can work and can look professional and then deserves the time and attention and publications that people so maybe one thing to think about with the village is to ask the village um, participants what they can do to help to disseminate information about their participation in the IGF. Okay. Thank you, Marilyn. We were actually able to hear you by voice in the room. Um, and uh, we were able to hear, and the echo was resolved by the um, mics as well. So if you actually use your headsets, um, that should facilitate uh, participation from online participants, I hope. 
Any any comments, anything from the Secretariat on the village or um, Dennis with respect to communications or to Marilyn's points? Um, just to agree with Marilyn that those are very good points uh, and, and, be, uh, and we should do more uh, as the message came yesterday as well in the marketing and outreach, it all comes to the same point how we can uh, send the message uh, in, 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 in very brief but interesting uh, ways. And, and that's clear that we have to continue to work on that. Oh, yes, I totally, sorry. I totally agree with what D D Dennis has said. And um, for the IGF village, we do have the village space. Currently, we have 47. Um, uh, 47 um, applications for space there in the village. Um, as far as helping the NRIs um, participate into the IGF, I mean, we're working um, very hard on that. Part of the German funds, um, I think it's going to be announced today or tomorrow morning, is that we're going to um, be accepting applications from the national and regional initiatives um, for travel support to come to the um, IGF in Berlin, so uh, we are doing everything that we can to support that. Thank you. Um, you know, I frequently mention as well that, of course, the IGF and the Secretariat can take in-kind contributions. Um, interns and secondments are also um, part of the normal structure. So if there are organizations or entities or universities or programs that um, are interested in participating or if anyone um, has suggestions of who um, might be interested, then please contact the, contact the secretary. We have the facilities for doing it. What we need is the, the offer on the other, other end. As the queue is empty, maybe we can come back to something um, Paul said. And this year for the workshops, um, the MAG um, did decide to um, look for a more cohesive agenda. We had the three main themes, and uh, narratives were developed around each one of those themes. And that narrative was to support um, certainly, hopefully, a set of workshop submissions that would actually kind of fill out that narrative, um, which would actually provide us with um, some concrete ways to actually advance those particular topics. It does help with the story. It does help with creating messages at the end. And I just spoke this morning on one of the panels around inclusion. And the way the WISIS forum um, works is you submit a couple of questions that you want to answer. Um, the, the questions that I submitted were um, under the inclusion track. And specifically, the questions I submitted enabled me to highlight each one of the three tracks that we actually have this year and respond. So the, the question was about digital inclusion is a term that encompasses a broad sector of key internet governance issues. What can the IGF and all the stakeholders do to, help <clears throat> do to help ensure that internet governance processes are truly inclusive at all levels everywhere? So I use that to talk through, um, basically borrow very, very, very heavily from each of the narratives. That one I borrowed from, um, obviously, the inclusion narrative um, and did um, comment on NRIs. Um, both um, as key um, activities to advance um, internet public policy issues, but also as a very appropriate way to um, support development um, and um, inclusion opportunities, because it's not just about access to the internet, it is about um, many human issues in terms of participation, the right skills, the right opportunities to participate at, at all levels. And the second question was access to information and knowledge for all, depends on more than just access. It requires a safe and trusted internet. What else needs to be done? And there I pulled heavily from the data governance and the safety and security narratives. Um, I say that just to remind everybody that those narratives are there because I think if we actually focus on the narratives both as um, people have been developing their workshop submissions and as the MAG works to build the program, I think we um, accomplish some of the things that Paul actually um, outlined. Um, in terms of allowing us to, to kind of capture some conclusions or some suggestions or recommendations or, or more um, kind of concrete outputs from these discussions because we've built a story. We've actually 
um, tried specifically to advance a couple of more focused um, tracks. One of the things that leads to is um, what do we want to do around the main sessions, um, which we can come to in a moment. It would be really interesting to hear what people um, think about that. Um, it also um, has some implications for the MAG as they actually review the proposals. Um, you know, is an additional criteria um, ensuring that we're building a, a threaded discussion, if you will, throughout the, the meeting? Um, or are we, you know, evaluating them each independently, individually on the quality of the individual proposal? And that's um, a discussion um, one of the working groups is going to go away and have and bring that back to the MAG in the, the next week or so. Again, any comments or reflections from, um, from you know, the community on that item would be welcome as well. The MAG hasn't yet come to any conclusions on the main sessions. We've had several suggestions. One was that maybe we um, split them up a little bit. They don't need to be these three-hour blocks. Um, maybe we aggregate them towards the end where we can report out a little more um, uh, fully or fruitfully on the discussions that were actually held during the IGF. That obviously has implications for how we kind of process all the reporting and the outputs and, and draw um, those messages together. We have a, a good, I think, running set of experiences the last few years where we've really um, taken some pretty significant steps to capture the outputs from the individual workshops, but we would need to, to strengthen that. And there was, um, you know, discussion on do we want to kind of top and tail each one of those tracks by having, you know, one or a couple of sessions that actually introduce, um, for instance, the inclusion track um, and introduce the narrative and work through that and then again um, maybe capture some of the um, learnings, discussions, experiences through the, through the meeting. Um, there, you know, were various other suggestions and again the MAG hasn't had that discussion yet. We'll be having that over the coming days and weeks. Um, it would be really helpful to get um, any additional thoughts or comments from the community in terms of what works for you? Um, with respect to, as the speaking queue is still empty, <laughs> with respect to outputs um, yesterday, um, in terms of trying to open up the conversation a lot and to figure out how we all felt about the outputs, I asked a series of questions, which is who actually takes the chair summary and reads it? And again, I wasn't looking for a show of hands, but and then who actually uses that chair summary and sends it to people and said, this is really useful, you ought to look at this. Um, and if you do, great. Um, are there more people you can send it to? And if you don't, why not? Is it because it's not useful enough, because you can't find it, um, it's not concrete enough? I mean, why? The same thing with the individual workshops by topic. Do um, you look at the workshop reports or the topics and, and, and share them? Are they useful? Are you encouraged to share them? Um, and again, if not, what can we do so that that's your natural inclination as you say, damn, this is a really good, a good report. This is going to be really useful to X and Y and, and I'm going to share it. So, I mean, I threw that out both in, in terms of sort of sharing where the kind of mag discussions are at this point in time as a, as a point of information, but really trying to um, get some additional comments, reflections, thoughts from from the community. And I will stop talking there. Are these not the right things in terms of the community? Is there something else you'd actually like to to discuss? And again, I'm also fully cognizant that I think it this point, the makeup of both um, the people that are um, participating online and here are still largely MAG members. But you know, as the MAG members, we have a lot of other hats that we all wear. If there's something you can share from your organization um, or another hat or another part of your life, then then please jump in. Let's actually make this a dialogue. Jim, thank you. I was just about to say, I guess silence doesn't abhor. <laughs> uh, Jim, you have the floor. Great. Uh, thanks, Lynn. Uh, Jim Prendergast with the Galway Strategy Group. To respond to your comment about what people do with those reports, I have 
gone back and looked at them, mostly if I've missed sessions and want to catch up on something. Um, asking if people proactively share them, you know, I, there has to be a reason to share it. I'm just not going to share it for the sake of sharing. Oh, look what happened. It's somebody's looking for a workshop on broadband connectivity in, you know, developing countries. Oh, well, I'll point them to that as a resource. I think one of the struggles is there's so much information out there that people are looking at to try and, you know, to try and find answers to questions. Where does the IGF and the reports and all the outputs that we currently have, where does that rank in, you know, for lack of a better term, those search results? Um, you know, when people are looking for information on the various topics that are discussed, is the IGF the first place they think of? Or do they just go to Google and plug in, you know, what they're looking for and whatever comes back via the search engines is what, the, what they wind up using. So um, I know there was a lot of discussion about marketing, but maybe that's one component of that marketing effort is making the, making the requests or making the information that is available on the IGF website resonate better in search results as well. Thanks. I think those were good comments. I think there was also a comment yesterday that said it could be really useful for us to think about what are the audiences we're trying to reach with an individual workshop. Um, and maybe if we, we also had um, uh, quite a number of discussions on what we could actually do in terms of um, kind of advanced preparation for the workshop itself um, through the organizers and the moderators and the participants. Um, and then what might we want to capture, of course, coming out. And um, I don't know, maybe there's some, some things we could still do for the IGF itself and fully recognize that the workshop submission process is closing now. But I think this is more in the nature of kind of moderators and, and um, you know, what they set in the room. Um, if people really think about who would benefit from this information, who are we trying to reach with this particular topic or discussion, or, or what are we trying to advance, then maybe that would give a different context to the response and uh, would be more helpful. But I think that's, that's work that we need to do um, within the MAG, and I think that that's a, a really key point before we can actually really figure out what we need to do um, with both marketing and the actual outputs themselves. You guys are making me work really hard here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I actually don't like talking this much, and I'm trying to find the right balance of sort of sharing, you know, where the mag was yesterday in our discussions, but also, of course, where we are through various working groups and, and online activities. Um, but really to try and kind of generate reactions from the community and or um, even preferable um, new ideas, better ideas. We can also do something very different with this session if there's sort of a burning need within the community to discuss something else and this just isn't, you know, it's really top of mind. Or is it the way I'm processing the meeting. <laughs> are, we, are people better off with more succinct, concrete dis questions or discussions? Which I have to say I'm not sure is my strength, but <laughs> we can all jump in and try. Mm. And Dennis, you have the floor. Uh, uh, w w uh, actually, I would like to go back to uh, comments from Isaac, which I found very interesting, and I'm curious uh, what the uh, MAC members are, uh, or non, uh, or other people in the room thinking about it. I think Rachel uh, Raquel uh, said that one concern is to make it simpler, the MA uh, the IGF, uh, w if I understand correctly, simpler maybe shorter uh, with less uh, workshop sessions uh, and that could be an opportunity for developing countries to host it and I think that's something very interesting maybe maybe this is the responsibility of MAC uh, maybe that MAC could consider in the in the future years do we want a, a light IGF I mean if I understand correctly and and your your second point uh, about uh, technical network layer and application layer uh, was not very uh, very clear to me and and I don't know how 
what can this uh, community to to do it may, or maybe to better uh, understand it thank you very much and thank you very much Denise for the opportunity to clarify my points um, the first one is uh, related to making this of more um, cohesive program. Uh, one part is avoiding some of the repetitive discussions and making sure that when we leave, I think the UK representative make this point very well, when we leave the IGF, we know uh, what we talked about and we can drive this uh, forward. Uh, the other point is when you have to organize a meeting with 10 parallel tracks at least, uh, you require, for example, a venue, and I'm sure the IGF, uh, the German hosts know that very well. Uh, it does require a certain type of venue to comply with these requirements. And if you think about the developing countries, there are just a few, I come from Latin America, there are just a few places and cities that could have this kind of venue to be hosted. And uh, if they are, they are very expensive. So uh, having less sessions is, one, a content issue um, and, and making sure that we are uh, more uh, on target, but it's also uh, an organ organizing issue, if I may uh, put that way. Um, I hope that's that cleared the first question. On the second question, well, <laughs> now I can take more time. <laughs> um, let's... Uh, let me go back. What is the internet per se? Internet is really the internet working of um, um, the, this communications networks. If you think about, I'm, I'm trying just on the fly to, to explain this, that um, the difference with the communications that the internet brings is the package communications style. And this is done uh, by communicating the devices and the computers and uh, by, by networks, and those networks connect itself uh, with the others. And this makes uh, with kind of the certain, um, the same protocol, the, this interconnection, kind of an Esperanto, right? If you think about, you had networks that one speak English, one speak French, one speak Portuguese, and then you had this internet working uh, protocol that makes sure that everybody spoke the same language. And that comes with certain characteristics. One, uh, it needs to have the global reach. Uh, it needs to be, um, uh, to have this, uh, what we call the permissionless innovation, which is basically that there is no central authority. It needs to be distributed. Uh, and uh, you can't, uh, if you wanna go to the internet, this network, uh, you don't need to ask permission to anyone, right? It's it's something that um, that is key for for the internet to continue functioning. Now, when uh, you have the applications layer that is on top of that, so you have the. I'm going to simplify here. You have you you can technically you can have like uh, five or seven layers. You can discuss that. But I, I'm going to summarize into three layers. You have the infrastructure layer, which are the cables, which is the, let's say, the, the, the way you get connected. You have the internet, which is this middle uh, where you get this communications going, this networks uh, interconnection. And then you have the upper layer, which is the applications layers. And that's where um, those uh, platforms uh, are happening. The content uh, is happening, right? So most of the concerns nowadays, and when we perceive the internet or the digital society, if you may, uh, most of these problems are happening in the upper layer, right? In the content uh, layer, not in the internet per se. But there are certain kinds of decisions that, uh, uh, especially in terms of regulations, that can bring unintended consequences and can break this model of the, the, the internet. So just to mention a recent uh, decision uh, within the G7 that, for example, asks for um, the lawful, I, I hope I'm using the terms right, um, but the lawful access uh, for encryption, right? Um, encryption is one of those technical um, tools, if you may, uh, that comes from this uh, internet layer that are important for everybody. It's 
a protection for everybody. And if you have even one vulnerability, even if that's unlawful um, access that you want, any vulnerability can break it. And then you break the protection and the security for everybody in the internet layer. So, I mean, there are certain certain issues there that needs to be tackled. And um, most of the time, in the upper layer, you were talking also, um, there is a joke from the technical community that you might have the ninth layer, which is <laughs> the government layer, the political lands layer, which is, I mean, some of the decisions are not with the political lens. They need to be technical, technically grounded. And uh, this is part of the reason why the IGF is important, because these decisions need to be made with everybody on board and to understand um, through this dialogue what is possible and making sure that we all want security. So then let's see what we all can do in this table. I hope I could clarify. Did I? Yes. Okay. Dennis, is there any follow-up? About the first point, a light mag, I was also thinking what the others are uh, thinking about it. And also, second point, uh, it's somewhat clear, but also there are a lot of things happening like at the infrastructure level, like there is attacks to critical infrastructure, net neutrality. So while I, I agree, uh, but there are also other uh, concerns. Thank you, Raquel, and thank you, Dennis. Rajesh, you have the floor. <clears throat> thank you, Chair. IGF is the multi-stakeholder body, and uh, <clears throat> private sector, the telecom companies, and the government together in this event makes a lot of things very easy when the private and the sector understand ki that the government is properly communicated about the changes into the internet governance thing. The basic problem is ki when the government people are into the IGF, they understand and they try to resolve the thing verbally over discussion over there only. And the moment they are out of the IGF, again they become the hardcore bureaucrats and they start playing with the licensing sector and the private sector in the way the government is doing in from the past. Whether we can fix anything towards this stakeholder government, ki whatsoever we have discussed, at least they should implement that into their respective country so that actual benefit should go to the user as well as to the other stakeholder who are discussing into the IGF. Otherwise, coming to the IGF, having discussion, having everything over there, and going back to our country without any result over there makes unuseful. Oops. Th thank you, Rajesh. Um, Susan, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Um, I was I was just thinking in terms of the agenda um, for uh, for the rest of this morning session, and if we feel that we might need uh, something to to explore while it's uh, the open consultations, um, as we will be deciding on um, main sessions uh, uh, with following the 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 um, the main three themes that we have, digital inclusion, security, and um, I'm sorry, I'm blanking right now, data governance. Um, it might be useful before the MEG sets to that work to develop those sessions to hear from the community if they have any ideas um, on, on uh, particular uh, sub-themes. Uh, so I'm just saying if, if we come to a point um, during the day today where we might have time to suit that purpose, then we could take advantage of, of having, having uh, comments from the, the community. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Um, I'll go to Ananda and then come back on that comment and, and try and figure out what we want to do with the next few. Uh, thank, thank, you. thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm Ananda Raj Khanal and speaking, uh, having some uh, experience with the ITU process. 
Uh, I see that the way we, we are running this uh, MAG meetings and open consultations, uh, sometimes uh, we, we are out of, uh, you know, the content in the agenda that is already put. Uh, uh, in ITU D study groups, what we do is, uh, depending on the agenda, we invite uh, contributions from uh, the uh, member states uh, and sector members. Similarly, if we follow the method that the MAG members can put contributions or the community stakeholders put contributions in the agenda that we finalize, then we have something solid to present and discuss. And then it will be easier for us to come to a speedy conclusion on, on the agenda. And uh, now sometimes uh, there's no, no, no one talking and, you know, and we're not able to really consolidate uh, the issues that, uh, that we are discussing. And uh, sometimes we are lost where, what, what kind of things we are discussing. We are discussing so many issues not in sequence uh, and something like that. So I think if we follow that kind of methods that prior contributions on the given agenda by the MAG members, also by the community stakeholders, then uh, we follow that discussions on the agenda. And then we, it will be easier for us to come to a conclusion. So thank you. Thank you, Ananda. That's actually a good segue because I just did a quick kind of look around the room and in the chat room. And most of the people that are in the online room are here in the room as well. By some kind of rough count, there's probably 15 or 20 people that aren't MAG members that are participating. So that's a relatively small, small number. Um, and I think maybe we should, we should um, try and figure out offline how we reach out to the broader community and ask <clears throat> what would make this, this um, consultation day more helpful. Um, and you know, possibly getting agendas out earlier, more specific detailed agendas or specific questions. Or, But I, I think we need to think about that within the MAG. And I think we need to obviously ask the community as well, since um, that's who we'd expect to be, be um, participating in this. So I think that's a, a good, um, good suggestion. Um, one of the other things that, that Paul said, and of course a number of people um, actually said yesterday as well, is that um, you know, NRIs are very important. I think we all recognize that they're very, very important. I think it's one of the most significant, significant um, kind of developments within the greater IGF ecosystem. Um, we can, and I don't want to put Anya on the spot here, later in the agenda, we actually have a national regional youth IGF initiatives um, presentation. We could ask um, Anya to do that, and if there are any specific questions that the NRIs might have of the MAG, um, get those out and start a discussion there. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure that's a great idea because, you know, we, we need to make sure we have appropriate um, participation from the NRIs in the discussion. We have a lot of people in the room that are with NRIs, but, um, um, you know, it, it, it's certainly not precluded by the agenda, but it wasn't specifically called out. So that's one thing to, to think about. Um, we also had a workshop process review um, segment, which is where we wanted to um, share with the community um, what we had done within the workshop um, review process. We talked about that a little bit um, this morning already with respect to the focusing down to three themes, the narratives and the, um, but we were looking for some comments and feedback on that, as well as um, any comments or feedback on, on kind of the submission process itself. We continue trying to improve that and make that more clear, but is there anything um, you think the MAG should, should know? Um, we could pull those up to this morning. I think we do need to carve out a bit more time from, for this afternoon. Changatai has just informed me that there are five or six um, other um, related um, initiatives or um, internet organizations that want to take the floor under what normally is our last segment of the day. Um, and we also have the HLPDC report. And I think between those um, series of interventions in the HLPDC report, we probably need more like 90 minutes, not 60 minutes. So we will try and move some parts of the agenda up. And then the other suggestion, of course, is Susan had a suggestion as well where, you know, we might um, kind of advance some of the sub-themes under the narratives. 
Um, I think the narratives themselves were quite, were quite specific. I mean, they describe as an intent, a framework, in one of them. I mean, are we serious about that? If we're serious about a framework emanating out of a particular track and a set of discussions at the, at the IGF, what does that imply in terms of how the MAG actually does their review? Um, you know, is there some additional um, activities the MAG needs to put in place, you know, a, a different main session which has some kind of introduction to the topic and what we want people to keep in mind and what they want to discuss and what we're hoping to advance at the end, or um, do we allow a lot more time at the end of the MAG um, so that we can have a discussion on what we've heard through these various things and try and build um, the framework? Each one of the narratives, I think, had actually something specific that they were trying to concretely kind of deliver out of the out of the set of discussions. That's another potential um, opportunity. So I'll let that sit for a moment. Um, Chennai has asked for the, the floor, so we'll give Chennai the floor and then um, see if we can come back and well, you moved and um, see what um, what we want to do with the rest of the time. And, and Chennai, you have the floor. I moved just to try and get a better mic. <laughs> so, um, morning everyone. My name is Chennai Chair for the record. Uh, two questions and a point just to add on to what you've been talking about with regards to the NRIs and open day consultations. I wanted to find out if we, um, there's some of um, interlinkages between the communication that's done, and I know we've already got a working group on communications and outreach with the NRIs as well. So when we do have the open day consultations, to actually also ask of them to share widely with their communities as well as other groups such as the Youth Collaboration on Internet Governance, because I think that would also be useful in terms of we've done the communication or we've done the outreach, but if people don't show up on open consultations day, at least the MAG team has done its work. So that's one point. And then the second point, which I might not have understood quite correctly, the idea around sub-themes that was raised under the three thematic areas. I thought, um, from my understanding, we seem to have developed the sub-themes from the uh, call that was put out to the, the op for the issues from the community. And um, I think we actually started by putting them also into buckets into d what came out from the community and then trying to have a broader umbrella. So I think perhaps um, that could also be integrated if we're still going to go for the sub-themes, given that the um, the descriptions around the main themes are actually quite clear, but I think we can also still feedback on what already has come out from the call from the community. So it kind of seems as if we're not like leaving what has already been done by the community, by the call of the issues that they've put up. So maybe also focusing on that. Thank you. Thank you, Janai. Those are some very helpful, very helpful comments. If, um, if I look to what we did in the narratives and maybe combining both Sinai's comment and Susan's comment on, on sub-themes, um, I think we need to really try and stay with the intent at the last meeting, which is about the narratives and telling a story and advancing concretely these small number of, and so I want to make sure that we pay attention to sub-themes, but that we don't revert to oh, what are the sub-themes and, and let's just make sure we've got an appropriate set of workshops in, in the sub-themes. Because if you read the narratives, they're, they're quite clear. I mean, under the data governance narrative, um, for instance, it says, and now, of course, I've lost it, um, but that talks about um, a framework. The security and stability, the digital inclusion, says that the track aims to provide a framework for assessing and considering various elements and policies that can improve access to equitable opportunities. Um, they both, all three of them actually have, you know, a fairly concrete, um, description. Two of them specifically are calling um, for advancing a framework and the safety, security, and stability and resilience <laughs> title, which was pretty slick actually for that group to kind of keep those four in there as a, as a whole, um, actually talks about identifying what some of the strategies um, are for uh, advancing those areas in a multidisciplinary and multi-stakeholder fashion. Um, so if we're really staying with the intent of what the MAG said they wanted to do last time, are there some specific discussions we need to have within the MAG and things we should um, be discussing with the community now? And I'm really glad to see Halani 
come in because Halani was really helpful in um, progressing one of the tracks. So Halani, you have the floor. Thanks, Chair. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, I just want to make a statement that we considered a lot of, I think, what came up through the community consultation in terms of themes when we wrote particularly the data and algorithmic governance uh, session. So I actually personally would love to go back to a situation where we now focus heavily on sub themes and we end up with you know, 10 or 20 different sub things. I think that would defeat the purpose of focusing on the three, which was, a, I would say, a tough decision. Not everyone was on board in the mad when this decision was made. And I know particularly for the data governance, we went back. Solani, it's been a little bit difficult to hear you, but I heard your first point, and maybe you can come back in a moment in a second. Your first point was, I think support for sort of staying with the direction at the last uh, MAG meeting and the narrative and specifically that you wouldn't like to see us reverting to, I think you said 20 or 30 sub-themes as the focus. Um, that's what the I... Theme. Yes, that's right. And then your second point, you were cutting out quite badly when you started speaking there. The second point was that um, Certainly, the data governance uh, working group uh, went to uh, extreme lengths to go through the keywords or the themes that emerged from the community consultation and to take those into account and to capture as many of those words. In fact, our earlier versions contained the key themes that came up through the community. So again, a call for not changing that. And however, a strong support for, given the multi-stakeholder nature, for asking the community whether there are issues, policy questions in particular, that are absolutely not being captured within the three themes. I think that's OK, but we should not go back to the drawing board. Thank you. Thank you, Halani. I, I think your second point, and, and this could be really wrong, so please correct me, but I think your second point was that in the data governance um, track, which is the one that you were instrumental in drawing with, that it was actually updated um, with input from the community, and that's where the framework language came from. Is that what your point was? Yeah. Yes, it was based on the community consultation yes. the language. Yes, it was based on the community consultation the language. Okay. Thank you, Halani, and sincere apologies for the for the difficulty in in coming in here. Um, I hope we captured your points correctly. If not, in the the, the uh, transcription, then please um, please submit some some edits, and we'll make sure that they actually get reflected. Susan, you have the floor. Thanks, Chair. Um, <clears throat> so I should clarify, my earlier suggestion was a pretty simple one, um, is that while it's the open consultation day and before the MEG starts planning the main sessions, it might be an opportunity to hear uh, from the community what they would like to address in the main sessions. So is everybody clear on the question then? Um, I think it, not only what people would like to hear in the main sessions, but um, if you have suggestions on how to structure them, front end, back end, shorter, longer, et cetera, all those things would be welcome. Those things are all um, on the table, and we have certainly tried different models over the years here, too. So um, I think that was Susan from before. Zina, you have the floor. Yes, good morning, everybody. I, I am Zena Buharib, uh, Head of International Cooperation at Ogero Telecom from uh, Lebanon. Uh, Ogero Telecom is the incumbent operator uh, in Lebanon. Uh, I'm also uh, an outgoing uh, MAG member and uh, the coordinator of the Lebanese uh, IGF. Uh, 
Uh, my intervention here is to reconfirm that uh, IGF should give stakeholders from developing uh, countries the opportunity to engage in the internet governance uh, debate uh, and uh, to facilitate their participation in the IG uh, processes and arrangements. And this, sh uh, this should be clear to all as it's among the main uh, core principles uh, of the IGF. Uh, following the discussions on the workshop evaluation uh, and, uh, by uh, mail and yesterday uh, in the last part of, the, of your meeting, uh, I'm afraid this won't be really applied because I had a feeling that some of the regions uh, might be excluded. I'm talking mainly about the, the Arab region. Uh, we had this uh, problem. Uh, I know we are repeating the same uh, every year, but uh, I hope this issue would be taken into consideration when uh, working on the approved uh, workshop uh, for, uh, for this year, as we used to do in the previous uh, events, just to ensure uh, inclusion and uh, geographic uh, uh, diversity. Thank you. Thank you, Zina. And I think, as you know, we do actually work really hard to ensure that we've got appropriate diversity, um, certainly regional, um, but um, all the other categories as, as well. And I'm sure the MAG will continue to focus on that um, too. I'm not sure if one of your earlier questions had to do with support for getting to the meeting or not, um, but if not, I think we'll be hearing some of that um, probably tomorrow, um, if you're actually referring to some of the, the sort of funding the German government has made available and are working on the capacity building program with the, with the Secretariat. Um, ben, you have the floor. Thanks, Lynn. Um, it was just a short point, um, and I was an It was just a short point to to support um, Susan's suggestion um, that we seek views uh, specifically on the main sessions, and then I was going to broaden it up, but you already did this um, to say not just on what policy issues we might discuss at the main sessions, but what kind of main sessions we should have. What should be the structure, um, the length, the format? Uh, we, we already had a few comments from the community, and I, I know Paul from the UK government um, talked about different kind of uh, formats, but I just wanted to support that idea as uh, putting a concrete question to the community to kind of help stimulate discussion. Thanks. No, I think that was very good. Thank you. So the concrete question that's come up between Susan um, and Ben, of course, is um, are there specific suggestions from the community with respect to main sessions, either topics or policy questions. And then as a second variation of that, I suppose, are there um, any other suggestions just in general with respect to timing, location, et cetera? So we'll give you a two shot. You know, one thing I was just thinking as a tangent, <laughs> again, I'm filling space here, I think. Um, with, with respect to um, outreach to the community, engagement to the community, um, and particularly with both, I know that the internet governance community's intent to be more inclusive and to pull in um, all those voices and parts of the region that aren't here, whether it's an underserved community or um, marginalized, um, communities, et cetera. One of the unique opportunities we're going to have in the next um, few months is when the HLPDC puts out its report. Again, the HLPDC will deliver a report. They'll deliver it to the Secretary General, and the Secretary General will determine what to do with that report. Make it public, could make it visible in its current state, could um, take a separate set of recommendations from it. Clearly, he needs to go within the UN system. Um, to some level, I guess it depends on what the recommendations are. Um, and the Secretary General's office has said very clearly already that they want to hear from the internet community. Um, if we expect 
given this was Secretary General's high-level panel on digital cooperation and the UN is extremely concerned about frontier issues and, and frontier technologies, if we expect that that exercise is intending to drive the future of Internet governance um, and Internet development and inclusion and participation across the world, this is a great opportunity for us to build some processes online across the community utilizing um, certainly the annual meeting, but um, also working um, with the NRIs, you know, where there's interest and support, perhaps the, the DCs, maybe even some of the best practice forums, to, to really um, help hear broadly from the community about what they think about the future of, of Internet governance. So I think that's something maybe in the background we can continue to, um, to think, because I think it's a great opportunity to get those voices that don't feel that they've had the chance and, and you know, frankly, haven't participated um, fully in this process to date to help define um, a process that would actually um, support their participation going forward. That is something the MAG is going to have to and the community is going to have to think about, um, you know, in the, in the next coming months, assuming the report is out sometime in June-ish time frame, depending on, depending on the UN process. So. I mean, I'm actually quite excited because if, if we really can drive a robust um, consultation across the community, across the global community, um, with some efforts to try and get to those folks that haven't participated in these um, debates and discussions um, for some time now and get their views reflected, I, mean, I just think it's, a, it's an interesting, interesting opportunity. I guess we're entering our teen years and now we get to figure out what we want to do as we start to exit them. Paul, thank you. <laughs> you have the floor. Thank you. Um, Paul Blaker from the UK government. Um, I've got two completely separate points to make, if I can. So as there's an empty speaking queue, I'm going to <laughs> take advantage of that. And uh, first, just to respond to what you just said, um, I think uh, the MAG and the IGF does have a really uh, big opportunity here. Um, and I was reading the Secretary General's tech strategy, which was published uh, last <coughs> autumn. And uh, if co any colleagues here haven't had a look at it, I would really recommend it, because it's a great document with a lot of really interesting ideas in it. Uh, one of the things it talks about is how the UN system sometimes uh, is not comfortable and finds it difficult to work in a multi-stakeholder way and that this means that the, the UN has not engaged in these kinds of issues and, and with the tech community and the private sector community as effectively as it needs to, and that the UN needs to find uh, different ways of working in order to make sure that it's, it's uh, building those dialogues. Um, and I think that recognition is really important and is an opportunity for the IGF as a multi-stakeholder community uh, to come forward and both demonstrate how multi-stakeholderism can work within a broader UN context. Uh, and I think um, we would really be looking to the MAG to be seizing some of those opportunities. And um, This is my first MAG meeting, uh, and I hope we can have more of a dialogue uh, during the course of today uh, with the people who are appointed to the MAG to give their advice. So I'm really hoping to hear more contributions uh, from, from those people. And I think that's a really uh, fruitful area uh, where there is a kind of open door that we, are, we can push against uh, and, and come up with um, some, some valuable uh, ways forward. So that was just to respond to what you just said. But I wanted to take the opportunity to talk about the themes, and in particular from the UK government point of view. I think we really uh, <coughs> welcome the fact that the theme on security includes uh, this concept of safety, uh, which is... Uh, topic uh, of major concern in the UK at the moment uh, and I will use my place on the speaking queue to give a very short advertisement if you'll allow me uh, and let colleagues know that on Monday the UK published a white paper on online harms. Um, online harms includes uh, a range of online behavior, online content which is sometimes illegal but also behavior and content which may be legal but harmful. Uh, that might include things like cyberbullying, online harassment or abuse, harmful content around suicide, for example, or eating disorders. 
uh, and how can we address those those kinds of issues in a way which fully respects uh, human rights and an open internet and the white paper sets out a range of measures it proposes uh, a new regulator in the UK a duty of care towards users and an enforcement framework it's built on uh, a number of principles uh, the principle that what is unacceptable offline should be unacceptable online the principle that users should be empowered to manage online risks and stay safe uh, and the principle that technology companies have a responsibility to their users um, uh, it, it proposes a, an approach which we hope will be agile and risk-based and proportionate and which as I said will be supportive of human rights online and supportive of innovation and I should emphasize as well it doesn't change in any way the UK's support for the multi-stakeholder model of internet governance and for a free open and secure internet and we've taken the multi-stakeholder approach in developing the proposals in our white paper uh, because we believe that all stakeholders have responsibilities to tackle online harms and we need to work together and collaborate in order to be effective so these these are the steps that we've been taking in the uk uh, we know there are many other countries and stakeholders around the world who are grappling with very similar issues, uh, who are sometimes taking similar approaches to us, sometimes different approaches. And we think that the, th the theme of security, safety, stability and resilience will be a really good opportunity to bring people together from different parts of the world uh, and discuss some of these issues, discuss the different approaches. I think we are all, in a sense, feeling our way together through some of these really tricky issues but um, we all recognize that there are legitimate public policy concerns uh, which our citizens expect to be addressed and the IGF as an open multi-stakeholder forum to us is an, an outstanding platform in which for us in which we can come together uh, and collaborate and address those issues together so I just wanted to emphasize that as something that we are particularly interested in in that theme for Berlin thank you Thank you, Paul. Those are very, very good comments. And to come back just briefly to your first one for a moment, um, the report you mentioned is a very, very kind of impressive, sort of insightful report. And I asked the secretary to actually put the link in the chat room, but I, I think we should probably actually put it on the MAG um, mailing list as well. Not everybody is in the, in the chat room. Um, so again, I do think the, uh, you know, the HLPDC um, activity and its report and you know clearly there's been an increased focus on the IGF as a result of some of those activities is really our opportunity to, to step up and and I think understand um, where some people see some necessary areas of improvement or some shortcomings and really I think get our voice into that process um, which will allow us to actually build an internet governance um, set of processes or ecosystem that really does address um, so many of the areas we continue to talk about, which is inclusion and access of those people that haven't participated in this problem, of marginalized communities, of um, developing countries, um, of the South, et cetera. So I think there's a, you know, a lot we can do. We should be reinvigorated by that. And as I said before, I think the excellent news is that the Secretary General's office made it very clear that they saw the IGF as a very important um, venue and set of processes to actually um, consult um, broadly. On, on the report, and I think it's up to us to define that. I had suggested in that meeting that it wasn't just during the IGF annual meeting itself, but that we find a way to um, drive a really aggressive set of online activities which would reach out much more broadly for some of the reasons that I've just just um, stated now. Um, uh, we have Eve Matthew in the queue. Eve, you have the floor. Thank you, Lynn. I would like to apologize for not having respected earlier the etiquette of uh, this <laughs> session. No, I found a way to ask my line. Um, this is precisely what was said by uh, the UK uh, representative, precisely what we intend to do in the global citizens conversation. I mean, this topic of having a safe space, having a space where what happens online should respect the same rules than what happens offline is typically typically a, a great topic for 
the one part of the day that we will spend with ordinary citizens. And uh, so if you have other angles that you would like to share and to put on the forefront of this uh, dialogue with ordinary citizens, please share them because, and you see the connection that can be made between what will be the say of ordinary citizens and the agenda, the agenda of the IGF. I mean, there will be a, a direct connection and it will be having the say of citizens will also be a tool to make sure that the work inside IGF is solution oriented and not only problems oriented. And it, it will be a, a strong support for that, I think. Thank you very much for your proposition and your theme. Thank you, Yves. And now we have Raul Echeverria on the, in the queue. It's an online participant. I hope we can hear you okay. If not, we've had some success with the headphones in the room and we can work through a transcription. Raul? Well, we're trying to make this work, so just a moment, I think. Are we going to be successful, Luis? <laughs> he seems to be connected. Uh, he must probably need to speak. Probably seeing his eye. Maybe we can check. Raul, can you try speaking? Yeah, try speaking. Yeah, it's very faint. So, Raul, can you, I'm not sure if it's Hi, on your one, end. Two, three. Oh, yes, that was better. That was better. We heard one, two, three. <laughs> yes, the only, the only problem is that I receive my own audio. <laughs> oh. <laughs> is, it, is it adequate for you to go ahead, though? Um, I, I will be very short. Yes, uh, thank you very much for all the work you are doing. Um, um, I think that some of the innovations you have introduced in the IG organization are very good. Um, I appreciate the, the policy questions are very good idea. Uh, will be very helpful to organize a constructive uh, discussion. In fact, it's, it's important, as, as somebody mentioned a few minutes ago, that the, the main sessions also uh, are based on on some policy questions. One of the of the challenges, however, in in the in terms of uh, how useful the IGF is, is how we use the the outcomes of the different sessions. There is a, a lot of discussion always uh, about the the. the the outcomes that are or can be created, produced by the by the IGF, and if, if we look at the, all the, the um, reports of the workshops and the sessions and the and the IGF general report, there is a lot of material. So the challenge is how we use it later. And we should encourage the workshop organizers to bring the outcomes of the workshops they organize to the several other forums where the given topics are being discussed. And probably this should be something that should be reported by the, the workshops proposal in the future. What did they do with the, with the outcomes of the workshop they organized? So I think we should expect that the people not only come to IGF to organize a, um, a fund session, uh, can probably get funding to attend the IGF uh, based on that, but really to use the outcomes of the discussions in a, in a productive and, and useful way. Of course, we have to do the same with the main sessions, and, and it requires a muscle, and we know that the IGF Secretariat doesn't have all the resources that it needs, but we have to work on that, how, the, how we get the resources to really to push the outcomes of the discussions to different forums. This is the way that uh, people that is not involved in IGF but is involved in a specific discussion somewhere else will find the, the, 
the outcomes of the IGF and the IGF uh, itself useful to support uh, the work they do in other areas. That's uh, all so far. Thank you. Thank you, Raul. Um, the the scribes managed to catch I don't know, probably about half of what you said. I mean, evidently it was a really significant echo. Um, so perhaps you can take a look at that and then um, just supplement it with your own comments. The one point that I think they um, weren't able to catch appropriately was your comment on the outcomes, which I think um, suggested that in addition to um, organizers as they actually prepare for the workshops and participants as they engage in the workshops, um, maybe an additional responsibility, if you will, ought to be for people to really consider actively how they actually disseminate that um, so that it's part of both the input to the workshop, the workshop, and the responsibility on, on participants' as way to really focus on what is it we might take away and how do we disseminate it and to who. Um, if that was, um, if I didn't hear that correctly, um, if you could correct it. And if you could take a look at the transcript, that would be helpful because I think the points were, were important. Um, Yuta, you have the floor. Thank you, Raul. Uh, thank you, uh, Lynn, for giving me the floor. I just wanted to thank uh, Paul from the UK for his comments and for referring our attention to uh, not only to the report or the white paper from the UK government, but also to, uh, to uh, the interlinkage between security and safety. Uh, I do think when we, uh, as a MAC, created the theme of security, safety, stability, and resilience based on the input that came from the community. We were aware that this is a huge bucket, that we have a lot of things to address within this bucket, but uh, that uh, safety and resilience of, uh, of users are uh, of uh, very high importance. And we try to address this in the short narrative that we, we gave for, for workshop proposals on safety, security, stability and resilience, but I'm really thankful for Paul for highlighting this again, and I would also like to refer the attention to the white paper, which I think gives a lot of guidance for us also uh, when we come to, to build the program and to assess the workshop proposals. Thank you. Thank you, Yuta. Are there any further comments or reflections? I think Raul also pointed us to the need to think carefully through the main sessions as well. Um, but we've had a couple of runs at that. <laughs> then maybe, yes, you have the floor. Uh, hello. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, I should thank uh, IGF Max for uh, holding a uh, decision. Uh, I'm I, I'm Mukhabir from Iran NCC, and I'm uh, an academic. Uh, I'm not the member of the MAG. Uh, I would like to thank the MAG for holding this open meeting today. Uh, I would like to rise up uh, three policy issues that can be put in the agenda in uh, IGF Berlin 2019. Uh, the first issue uh, is uh, social responsibility of tech company and we can uh, work together more on ma uh, making norm package about the tech company social responsibility as a critical uh, agenda for for the future the second the second issue is uh, the very important issue of igf branding i think many people even expert in some country and uh, don't know IGF and its mission very well. And I think the IGF Secretariat should uh, wo uh, should uh, work more on uh, branding, IGF branding. I think some uh, platform, some 
tech company like Google, YouTube, social media can help IGF uh, <coughs> uh, in the branding project. For example, uh, <coughs> they can establish and in, uh, integrate a global suggestion system in their platform uh, with the special icon of IGF in their platform and uh, <coughs> allow the users, global users, uh, to uh, put their suggestion, their idea, and send it through their uh, through uh, the Google and YouTube, uh, uh, and send it for the IGF. Uh, and uh, <coughs> this global suggestion system uh, in the uh, platform like Google and YouTube for IGF can help to collect the views of all the stakeholders and especially global users, usual usual users. And uh, <coughs> this, uh, the third issue is uh, unilateral coercive measures in internet. Uh, I think it's the biggest and critical challenges in and digital development in some countries and uh, we should address uh, such issues in uh, IGF uh, agendas. Uh, I think uh, there is a good question we should answer uh, in uh, IGF Berlin 2019. Uh, and it's the, and, and the question is that how can we combine the multi-stakeholder multi-stakeholder approach with a multilateral approach in in the in the global level uh, within the framework of UN? Uh, I'm talking about a vision a vision of unite uh, digital united nation and uh, more uh, transparent and more. Uh, democratic internet governance uh, model. <coughs> uh, by this way, I think we can give the uh, usual users uh, <coughs> have a voice in the internet government process. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and welcome as well. We managed to speak last night about interest in, in NRI, so that's great. Um, Hannah, Hannah, you have the floor. Uh, good morning, Chair and colleagues. Uh, Hannah Lahashmi, MAG member. Uh, I'd like to, to return to this discussion on, on outcomes, because I think a, a couple of the comments made today have been uh, pretty clear on the need to prioritize those. Um, also, as a, as a voice from the developing South, particularly small states, um, I know that that's an absolute priority. Um, so there's two ways of looking really at outcomes um, that might help structure uh, this discussion. One is in terms of the volume and the other is in terms of the usefulness of outcomes. Um, so there have been a couple of comments earlier on, on the reports of workshops, um, you know, the number of reports of workshops and whether it's, it's helpful to have um, several or whether you know, aggregate reports and key messages are helpful. Um, but a lot of our discussions so far have focused on, on summaries, um, but, but not necessarily uh, other kinds of outcomes. So I think it's 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 worth it to take a look at um, at the Tunis agenda in, in, in light of this um, and and the mandate of the IGF itself. Uh, you know, the first point in the mandate does request a discussion on public policy issues, uh, which I think is done um, at you know very very well. Um, but there's other parts that I think could probably be built on further or at least be, be uh, presented in, in a more useful way. Um, and that includes facilitating the exchange of information on best practices. Um, it includes the advisory role uh, for stakeholders um, in proposing means and ways to accelerate the availability and affordability of the internet. Uh, and on that point, I, I think that this needs, it, it has to be a, a priority for this year's IGF, given that uh, the target in the sustainable development agenda on universal access um, in least developed countries matures in nine months. So I think it's, it's absolutely essential that that's a, that is a huge focus of this year's IGF. But continuing on the mandate, there's also um, a call for enhanced engagement of stakeholders in existing future internet governance mechanisms. 
um, and identifying emerging issues. Um, I think it's worth mentioning here that the point on identifying emerging issues is something that was called on in the IGF, um, but I'm not sure, and, I, and if, if others see a different uh, approach, then please do let me know. I'm not sure that that was responded to by the system until there was really a resolution through the General Assembly calling on the UN uh, to look into uh, rapid technological change. Um, and I think that was in 2017. Uh, and since then, you see a, a multitude of reports and a multitude of, uh, or, or more consideration of emerging issues. So I wonder um, whether there would be a way to to get recommendations out of the IGF as well. Um, and then the other point I wanted to highlight is contributing to capacity building. Um, so this isn't cherry picking the mandate, but it's just looking at some points that perhaps a ask for a different kind of outcome rather than just reports. Um, it might ask for sessions that encourage accelerated action, that encourage more partnerships. Um, there are different parts of uh, different fora that also do this, but there's um, there's no reason why, why the IGF couldn't as well. Um, I think one concrete proposal, um, and, and thank you to Paul for, for bringing this back from yesterday, was um, in looking for common threads uh, through, through the program. Uh, so uh, this is in support of the idea of, of having a main session and then connecting that with breakout sessions and then bringing them back um, in, in a way that, that is outcome focused and that, that helps uh, um, I think I'd also like to recall a point made uh, earlier on you know, what, what happens in the IGF stays in the IGF. Uh, I think that was an interesting point, um, but, but it does speak to, to a bigger question of uh, you know, how to continue the discussion and continue um, working towards solutions uh, af after the main session. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Those are very... Very good comments, very, very insightful comments. Um, Carlos, Carlos, you have the floor. Thank you, Lynn. Um, uh, I don't know if the, there is a proposal for an over overarching th theme for Berlin already uh, defined, etc. I, re I re recall reading the transcript yesterday saying that it could be one world, one vision, one web shaping the future of the net. Uh, I have some issues with it. The internet more and more is going far beyond just the web. And there is a scientist, Bruce Schneier, who calls it the internet plus due to the diversity of billions <coughs> of interconnected devices and their functionalities. I would suggest, if this is the proposed overarching theme, that the web is replaced by internet itself. Maybe one world, one vision, one internet, a dialogue on the future of interconnected societies. I have issue also with the shaping the future, because can I say that shaping the future is not really what the IGF does, as it cannot make recommendations? So these are my uh, concerns about the overarching, overarching theme of, uh, the, of Berlin. Thank you. A moment um, to think before she comes in, but I, I do just want to make a, a quick comment on your, the IGF can't make recommendations. It's not exactly a, a true statement. We don't expect to make binding policy recommendations, right? But in fact, Tuna's agenda specifically says make recommendations. It would be useful if X organization looked at why could be a recommendation a BPF is a recommendation so it's just that this is such a loaded um, discussion in our in our context I wanted to make sure that didn't sort of stand alone there I'm gonna give Danielle a little bit of time <laughs> Danielle you have the floor thank you yes maybe I can uh, explain a little bit um, what was behind this idea of a sort of a theme or, or motto uh, we expected, in fact, that someone would raise the issue of, of web or internet. Um, basically, we have chosen web due to the fact that we have 30 years of web, and then basically this is um, a nice sort of alliteration, the world and the web, but the, <laughs> the W at the beginning, right? Uh, so, and then the idea was to, to take up the issue of internet in, instead of web. That was like 
shaping the future of the net. Right? So that was basically the idea we had behind the, the idea of the motto. Plus, uh, like Nin said, yes, I mean, recommendations are part of the mandate. And our idea was to, to raise the attention and, um, and the impact of the IGF. And, and then, I mean, it doesn't have to be shaping, but it should be something that gives the impression that if you want to talk about the future of the internet, if you want to influence the debate on the internet, you should be in Berlin at the IGF. That's basically what was behind the idea. Rudolf, as one of the fathers. <laughs> it's just that we had, um, I think the, you, had a, you had another order. I think our proposal was one world, one web, one vision. You, I think you had another order of the of the of the three, but that's all. Uh, yes, maybe maybe Rodolf, you're right. Yes, and I agree that uh, uh, on the difference between binding and non-binding recommendations, of course. But uh, uh, Daniel uh, mentioned that. Uh, uh, it would, uh, it could uh, be not shaping, but influencing the future of the internet. Maybe it would be better. I don't know. So in that, in that case, I'm immediately thinking about the influencer on the internet. <laughs> My objection, I think, if I had one, and I'm not sure I have a strong one, is on shaping the Internet or shaping what we're all trying to do or doing, I think, is influence society in various ways to do things. And every time we say it's the Internet, I think it, it drives a different mindset in people's minds. And most of the things that are magical that are happening on the Internet and the things that are bad that are happening on the Internet come from us. They come from society. They don't come from technology or bits or bytes. And, and I... I I mean, I'm not sure we've done a, a, the world of sort of service here by continuing to focus on the Internet, um, because I think it drives people to look to places that aren't as helpful as they could be and not as robust and complete as they could be with respect to understanding the problem statement and therefore what the solution are, is. Um, so I don't know if there's a way to even think about it and do something which is more sort of society or that brings it back to kind of the, the individual or the human. but. I'm not wanting to overcomplicate what you're doing either or what's what's there or this discussion. Maybe we can let that percolate a little bit and, and come back. Carlos? Uh, just, uh, just a final note is that uh, at least we are trying to discuss this, which is interesting. I remember that all the IGFs had an overarching team, and uh, I, I was wondering if this one would have one which is significant relating to the actual situation of the Internet today. And uh, I think we are, we are almost there. Thank you, Carlos. Um, let me ask Anya. We'd like to pull up one of the items from this afternoon, but we have we have a, a number we could pull up, Anya. And I know you have um, a, a, an informal gathering or lunchtime meeting of the NRIs. Um, we can keep the NRIs after um, the lunch break. That's perfectly fine. Um, if you want to start it now and we come back later, if there's some additional discussion, that's fine as well. Because as I said, we have opportunities. We could actually move to um, start the, the quick um, introduction on the best practice forms and dynamic coalitions. And again, the intent was there that we just kind of introduce them here to the community. Obviously, they've been on the site for some months. but And ask if there's any kind of inputs, thoughts, ways to improve other organizations to work with, that sort of thing. Um, we can pull that forward. So it's really what do you think suits you and, and the NRIs, be NRIs best in terms of timing? Yes, thank you very much. Well, I am fine with whatever you would advise, but I like when the discussion has continuity. So maybe if we could um, start with the NRIs discussion after the lunch break and then just finish it in one block, that would also help us to keep the momentum. And I did. Um, 
take relatively a lot of notes from um, from the stakeholders that shared their views on the NRI. Also, some questions that were not responded. So maybe I'll just take the floor briefly after the lunch to respond to those. And and it, as you mentioned, we do have very informal, basically a friendly gathering of the NRIs to discuss on um, some internal matters for the group. Everyone are invited to stay in this room. Uh, it will be from half past one to half past two. Thank you. Thank you. Um, then we have sort of 40 minutes or so left. Um, why don't we, and the, there's an empty queue. We've put out the discussion on kind of main sessions and topics and formats and things. and. Um, you know, there's been a little bit of discussion, but not robust. It feels that like we've sort of um, aren't there at the moment or exhausted that. So um, let's go to um, the um, best practice forums. And if we could just walk through each one of the best practice forums. We had asked the um, leaders to do literally no more than five minutes and hopefully sort of two or three minutes um, on what the best practice forum is, the kind of current status. And then um, we'll ask for um, suggestions. At this point, I would say either from the community or from other MAG members. The BPFs specifically are driven by the MAG, and I actually think MAG members could be um, more deeply engaged and more broadly engaged in the BPFs as well. So this would be an opportunity to, to start that. Who wants to go first, or shall we just go with the order that's up there? I saw Ben put his hand, and cybersecurity is there first. So Ben, you have the floor. Thank you, Lynn. Um, so I'm the MAG member who's the co-convener of, of the BPF on cybersecurity. Um, we also have another co-convener, Marcus uh, Kummer, who's here today. And we have a, a lead expert, uh, Martin van Horenbeck, uh, who works at FIRST. That's the International Confederation of Computer Incident Response Teams. So um, to give a little bit of background at our last face-to-face -face meeting in January, uh, I brought forward a proposal for the BPF to focus this year on exploring um, best practices which would support the implementation of the Paris Call on Trust and Security in Cyberspace. Um, the Paris Call was actually developed under the auspices of the Paris Peace Forum, um, but ended up being launched at the IGF meeting in, in Paris last year. Currently has almost 550 signatories. Uh, that comprises 65 governments, over 100 civil society organizations, and, and over 300 companies. So the feedback from the MAG when uh, we met in January was that the BPF should cast its net wider and not focus exclusively on the Paris call this year, but look also to other relevant uh, international agreements and initiatives. So we adjusted the proposal accordingly and it was approved by the MAG at its uh, following virtual meeting in, in mid-February. So we've begun work uh, with the first meeting held last month. Um, the approach we've taken is one that worked well for the BPF last year. So after discussing a, a general approach um, with the BPF, we formed a volunteer group to create um, a background paper which will help scope out the work and inform the, the call for inputs that we put out to the community. So the background paper is going to identify which agreements, initiatives, and legal frameworks should be the focus of this year's work. Um, looking generally for agreements with multiple signatories um, and from different stakeholder groups. In May next month, we will put out a public call for contributions and uh, that should remain open until mid-July. And obviously, we'll work with the Secretariat and our consultant to um, make sure there's, there's wide engagement and uh, dissemination of this call to try and maximize the input we receive. Uh, I think we're going to try something which we did last year, which was alongside a specific, uh, an open call to the community in general. We tried a, a more specific call to NRIs, and we also um, uh, our lead expert spoke uh, to the NRIs on one of their coordination calls. Um, we're hopeful that this year that, that might help uh, gather some input from NRIs. We didn't get any last year. At the very least, it, it's another way of uh, just raising awareness of the work we're doing this year. 
The summer break uh, will then be given over to the drafting of the report by the consultant, um, as well as any further engagement as needed um, to broaden the input that we have to report. And then in September, the, the best practice forum would be consulted on the draft report, as well as um, discussing uh, what to do with the BPF session that will be held at the annual meeting in Berlin. And then we will publish the draft report. Um, we're aiming to publish the draft report by the 8th of October. That's six weeks before the Berlin meeting. Uh, the BPF report gets finalized based on any further input received at the annual IGF meeting. So the thinking of publishing the draft report six weeks in advance is that it provides time for stakeholders to, to reflect on the report and to consult colleagues before coming to Berlin. Um, particularly, we were thinking of, of governments where they often, of course, need to consult across departments and get sign-off before being able to provide um, public input. So that's the state of play with the cybersecurity BPF at the moment. Thank you, Ben, Marcus, and Martin. Are there any kind of comments, reflections on, on, that, on that BPF in particular? Maybe what people are thinking. I'd like to make just kind of a reflection on, on the NRIs. I, lots of people look to the NRIs to support their, their um, projects or programs or initiatives, and, um, and they're oversubscribed in volunteer efforts just as all of us are. But I think maybe um, we could um, think about the NRIs are important both in terms of what they do nationally, locally, and regionally, but in terms of supporting outreach and engagement, if there are experts or organizations or entities you know of in your country or your region that you think would be interested in the work of a BPF, um, it could be as simple as making that connection between the two, um, which still is supportive of the NRI because you're bringing something of value and benefit and interest to the NRI while it's obviously supporting um, a more global effort, which obviously enriches that effort as well. So um, I, don't, I don't know if there's some work we can do to think about a, a different ways we can, you know, kind of expand out from an NRI connection, which is of benefit to the NRIs and of benefit to, to the global processes as well. It, I don't think, I, I think sometimes everybody thinks it needs to be kind of a, a formal NRI position or another project within the NRI to pull together a, a set of responses and things, and, and I think there's, um, you know, a lot of value as well in just in in making the connections in in the networking effort, and I really mean I think it's a value to the NRIs as well as of course to the projects and initiatives as as well. Um, let me see. I see. Did you put her hand up for the best practice forum on? I never get the order right. Artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, and big data. So you have the floor. Hey, uh, thank you, uh, Lynn, for giving me the floor. So um, um, the BPF this year um, actually has had uh, two virtual meetings on the 1st of March on the 1st of April. We are going to have the third one on uh, April 15th, so next week. And the BPF has uh, this year for um, coordinator. Uh, there is uh, uh, Martin Butterman from its uh, Dynamic Coalition Coordinator, and then uh, also Mike Cloudfor and uh, me and Alex uh, Cominos. <coughs> so, and uh, <coughs> um, as last year, I mean, uh, the BPF uh, actually focused on um, most of um, on um, finding best practice to better use the three technologies. And uh, this year, the um, BPF is still uh, uh, focusing in um, the areas where the three technologies are used together in an internet context, but is try to focusing more, more, more on trust and uh, how uh, the technologies can be used to address societal uh, uh, challenges. So um, starting from the charter that has been approved from the MAG, there was um, a new a kind of a narrative, overarching theme that has been defined uh, from BPF that is um, un, um, entitled Enhancing Justified Trust in IoT, Big Data, and Artificial Intelligence. 
So um, actually, uh, the BPPF is um, in the process of identifying key policy questions to help and uh, structure its work, but uh, we had a quite a fruitful discussion during the, the last uh, virtual meeting. We focused a lot on trust, try to identify what are the, the key factors that impact on trust, like liability, security, and so on. We also discuss a lot about um, uh, policy and regulation and uh, data set uh, um, quality. And uh, more uh, we try to identify use cases that uh, could, help, could help to understand better how to improve trust on, uh, on, uh, on this um, application. So, and, uh, and then, um, as I told you, we had more than 20 participants. And then we also decided to launch a survey just to try to share what are the best cases from, uh, from the community. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I see Raul is in the queue. Um, I assume that's in reference to this particular BPF. We do want to hear from the community, and then we will go to the third and the fourth one. Raul, you have the floor. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, just a, a quick, uh, uh, two quick comments. Uh, one is about the, the main theme that's... Uh, Carlos already commented on that. Um, I'm, I have to say that I'm fine with shaping the future. I understand uh, why the, this uh, world has been, uh, in, but the one problem I have is with the expression of ambition. I, I don't understand. I, am, I understand the value of uh, one world, one internet. It is supposed that uh, ITF is exactly the opposite. It's about uh, multiple visions. It's, we are not looking to or to build one single vision about the internet and the policies related to the internet. So this is something that make, uh, makes sense. Raul, I think we heard your point um, with respect to the, the, the theme or the title. Um, Okay, we can't hear your voice anymore, but the scribes can hear you and are scribing, so I will um, be quiet and we'll read. Thank, thank you, Raul. Um, so we had voice for your first set of comments. The, the second one was a comment with respect to the BPF on AI, Internet of Things, and big data, where, um, I recall, you said trust was a, was a key component of those discussions. The last point is on the um, NRIs, and Raul said himself that he's attended many NRIs around the world, um, and that he finds it useful to see the different models and um, that there are various models for producing outcomes. Um, we have kind of mentioned one or two here. Um, I do hope um, we get more information, more suggestions on the basis of those um, experiences and practices as we actually um, move forward this discussion because I, I, think, um, I, I think there's some very good models there and that's precisely what we're actually here to do is to share kind of experiences and, and good practices. Um, Carlos, Carlos, you have the floor. Yes, may I comment on the BPF on local content? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, we um, uh, actually, Giacomo Mazzoni, uh, uh, Wing, and me, we uh, proposed to recharter this BPF. And uh, on the basis of, of what was done in 2018, which was an excellent work, 
and there is not much that should be changed in the original proposal. Uh, one motivation for bringing the, the BPF to 2019 is that uh, there is one component perhaps of the one done in 2018 which is not here and uh, is not uh, only to emphasize the importance of generating local content and then building capacities or developing capacities for generation of content and so on, but also an emphasis on preservation of content, which, uh, you know, for certain political or historical or conflicting reasons, um, changes in official documentation or in, in historical accounts may happen. And uh, content which is precious may disappear uh, due to these, you know, reasons. And I think that the BPF could consider this and perhaps bring to the discussion uh, some examples of efforts to preserve content with this idea in mind of preserving local content and also, of course, trying to contribute to development of new content and so on. Thanks. Thank you, Carlos. Are there any comments, follow-up questions from the room, MAG or, or community like with respect to that BPF? Giving everybody a moment to find the cube, but apparently not. Okay. Um, we have one final gender and access BPF. Is there anybody here who's prepared to speak to that? Is she here or online or? Apparently the, um, the individuals that are actually leading or co-leading this are actually out of the room at the moment. So we'll, we'll come back to them. Um, what I would like to say again is that the BPFs are um, chartered by the MAG. Um, they are a work output of the MAG um, through the community and with the community. Um, so please, all MAG members should be paying attention to those BPFs and doing what you can to support them, to participate in them, or to ensure that you're um, providing other kind of networks and, and linkages to the work. We have been told many, many times that the BPFs are, are some of the more um, kind of consequential outputs um, of the IGF, and I think it's important that we all do what we can to support them. Maybe then I'll um, move to the dynamic coalitions. I'm not sure if that's Yuta or Marcus or someone who can speak to both excellent voices. <laughs> Yuta? Marcus, I've spoken a lot today. Would you like to take over or shall I? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you for being so kind. Okay, so um, there's not so much new to report about the dynamic collisions. We have had, I do think, uh, two calls, the dynamic collisions in the last few weeks. And uh, we have now, if I'm right, Eleonora, 18 dynamic collisions since one new has been accepted directly this week. Uh, would you like to? Hi, Yuta. Thanks. Uh, that is correct. Uh, and the new DC is on uh, the sustainability of journalism and the news media with a, a lot of interesting um, uh, ideas that I think they're going to bring the, to the DC discussions. And we'll be publishing uh, information on that new DC online very shortly so everyone can read about them. Thank you for complimenting. So in, in the call, the Dynamic Coalitions once again uh, stressed that they, they would like to have the 90-minute slots back uh, on the agenda for the Dynamic Coalitions and uh, for the individual Dynamic Coalitions. And there was also uh, interest in having, again, a joint session uh, organized by Dynamic Coalitions. It's not yet decided what could be the focus of, of such a main session organized by Dynamic Coalitions, but uh, there were, was interest in having it somehow related to the three main themes that uh, we have uh, on the agenda. And 
My personal view is that with now 18 dynamic collisions, uh, this will be a challenging task to bring all this together uh, under the themes, but uh, this shall be discussed in further calls. And uh, what we also would like to, to stress is that uh, it, dynamic collisions are really a good, um, a good opportunity for people who are coming first time to the IGF commu community uh, to get engaged with uh, the, the issues that are dealt with uh, within the dynamic collisions. It's, uh, there is no threshold for any organization or individual to, to join a dynamic collision. It's just once you have joined, of course, you need to, to support the work of the dynamic coalition, but it's a very good way to, to engage in internet governance, uh, especially for people who start with, with internet governance, to make them acquainted with the work of the dynamic coalitions and also anything that's going on uh, in the IGF community. So I, I would like to encourage people to invite their own networks to have a look at the list of dynamic collisions, con consider which one of the dynamic collisions is related to the work they are doing, and then start to engage with dynamic collisions. Thank you. Thank you, Yuta. Marcus, I will see if there's anything you want to add, because you've been engaged with them for three years. Marcus is saying no, he's fine in thanking Yuta for <laughs> jumping in. <laughs> Um, I do think one of the things we're going to have to um, think through a little bit more is, as, as you just said, with um, 18 dynamic coalitions, um, with we have 114 national, regional, and uh, youth IGF initiatives. Don't be worried, they're not all looking for their own slots. Um, and Paul's comments earlier about the need to um, increase the support to the NRIs and their visibility and presence within um, the IGF ecosystem, which of course includes the, the meeting as well. I think we need to, to um, just think about, um, are there several different categories of workshop slots? And maybe think about what is the usefulness of any output, whether it's an NRI session, a DC session, or a workshop session, to what the MAG has said they want to accomplish with any year's particular IGF agenda. What I don't want to do is have a territorial conversation X number of slots to this one and X number of slots to that one. Because I think that's not, not appropriate and it's not helpful. So maybe we need to think about a, a, a different way to say what are they contributing to the theme and the agenda we want to accomplish here and um, use that as an, an appropriate focus. I mean, I, I haven't thought that through a lot, but I just, you know, Yuda's comment triggered it and, and a few reactions I saw in the room, I have to say, triggered it as well. Um, so I think we need to think about what's the right kind of set of um, metrics or filters you want to put on these discussions as we determine who gets what, what types of slots. And now I've got Marcus to speak, which wasn't my goal, but I'm always happy to hear him. Yes, Marcus, you uh, have yes thank you. Lynn, just a, a quick uh, comment on that and the specific nature of dynamic coalitions. Their meeting at the IGF is more actually like an annual general meeting. That's the only <coughs> only opportunity for them to meet physically on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And over the years, I think the Secretariat has been fairly strict in asserting that they fulfill a certain criteria, that their slot is not used just to bypass workshop selection criteria. OK, we can't have a workshop, so let's form a dynamic coalition and have a jolly good meeting, and we are given a slot automatically. So. That is clear, that should not be a way to bypass the very stringent workshop criteria by the MAG. But the point they also make, uh, they, they need some time just to do their work, and it's the only opportunity they have to meet. So there is a, a value in them having a meeting that allows them to contribute to the broader output of the IGF as a whole. So it, it's slightly different than all the other meetings. It's not, should not be compared to a workshop. It's more a meeting that facilitates and furthers their own process. But of course, uh, the MAG can be, and if there are more and more dynamic coalition, the MAG may wish to be even more stringent in setting the criteria that allows the dynamic coalitions to qualify for a slot at the meeting itself. But hence, uh, what Yuta said, 
they do say we do need some time just to do our work, just to conclude our work. And that is a point I was trying to make. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Um, I'm glad I actually got you to come in on that a little bit um, because I, I do think there's some fundamental principles there of, of us wanting to support the community in their activities. Um, we all say we support distributed networks and, and that sort of thing. And if we look around um, various academic studies or activities within the World Economic Forum, by example, the, everybody's talking about network networks and community processes and things that are spun up um, from the ground up. And, and I think there's um, a lot of learnings in what makes for a successful set of those activities um, and what are some of the support requirements they have around them that we could take out of, of looking at the DCs and identifying which ones have been successful, which ones could use something additional. I don't know what that is. I mean, I'm sure it's not just time at the IGF, um, but I think there could be some useful learnings in, in that as well. But thank you for putting a little bit more context to the discussion. Um, and we have Ben. Ben Wallace, you have the floor. Thank you, Lynn. Um, just as Yuta's idea of a main session with, with 18 DCs triggered your thoughts, uh, it also triggered mine. Um, to, uh, I, have, I have a couple of thoughts. I mean, Marcus's comment there about the annual meeting being an opportunity for a kind of AGM of, of DCs. We have, um, I know that it's not an element an unlimited number of rooms, but we have a bit more of a luxury of space this year. I wonder if there might be uh, a room which could be set aside for the DCs to have a, a meeting together and or uh, for people to come and, and talk to DCs and find out what they do. Um, so that might be something new that we could do with the luxury of the space that we have in the venue uh, and, and give the DCs an opportunity to uh, network, get together, or disseminate their work in a different way. Uh, in terms of uh, a main session, um, the main sessions are a finite resource. Um, I think, and this goes, I think, also for the NRIs, rather than carving off a session, we need to find a way to integrate them in, in, in the main sessions, in, in the discussions we have. So the themes we have touch on many of the work of the DCs. There's, there's lots of relevant work of the DCs uh, in the policy issues that we've identified in our theme. So it shouldn't be difficult to say uh, when we're looking at inclusion, for example, okay, when we're thinking of speakers, uh, there are one or two DCs that we want to come along and talk about what they're doing and, and how that's relevant to the discussion. I don't think there's any argument with getting, um, whether it's DCs or NRIs or um, you know, involved in main sessions of those. Everybody wants that type of integration. Um, I think we also need to be thoughtful with respect to what helps them advance their work, because their work is critically important, and I think that's another, another um, element of discussion we need to have. I don't see it as an either-or. I think some people see it as an either-or, but I, I, I don't think it needs to be an either-or. But that's why I think we do need to think carefully about what is it we're trying to do with the overall program. And maybe there's some other ways to think about how we, um, you know, pull all those pieces together. Um, we have Nicholas Smith in the queue. Thank you, Chair. Um, my name is uh, Nicholas Smith. Um, I'm actually um, also one of uh, the organizing members of the newly formed uh, Dynamic Coalition on uh, DNS Issues. Um, I just wanted to um, also put in some extra thoughts. I, I first want to thank um, Eleonora, Utah, and Marcus for all of their work and uh, their um, ability to um, gather us all together on our monthly uh, DC coordination calls. I find those to be extremely helpful. Um, it gives us an opportunity to um, engage with the other DCs and to hear also uh, some of the activities that they have planned for this year and for outputs. Um, you know, we have the, the luxury, I guess, for RDC that I'm here to be present. Um, also, Susan uh, Chalmers being a MAG member as well. But we had the opportunity to actually give a session about what the DC is trying to accomplish uh, this year um, as it relates to universal acceptance and UA readiness for um, IDNs. Um, we gave a, a pretty good presentation back in January at the first face-to-face -face meeting. Um, 
some of the other engagements that we have going on throughout the year. Um, and it's just something, too, that I also encourage all DCs to do if they can't come in person to a face-to-face -face meeting, is also to participate in other engagements throughout the year within the IG space. Um, for example, um, the, the DC, um, what we're going to be doing is we're working right now with the organizers of CDIG um, and EuroDIG. Uh, we have sessions planned for both of those um, locations coming up this year. Um, and we're also in the process of going to be submitting our DC um, session that we hope to have some very uh, substantive outputs out in Berlin this year in the fall. So thank you very much. No, thank you, Nicholas. That's a really interesting uh, new, relatively new DC as well. As I was saying your name, Nigel Hickson was putting his hand up over in the corner, so I'm not sure if he thought I was going to say <coughs> Nigel or if you were looking for the floor, Nigel. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wasn't. No, I, well, I mean, if it's possible. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Ni Ni Nigel Hickson. I can. I, I, I just wanted to, uh, and uh, I'm not really speaking on behalf of uh, a specific dynamic coalition, although I'm involved in Martin Bottomman's uh, 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 IoT, uh, I IoT uh, uh, dynamic coalition. But I, I, I just really wanted to support what Ben uh, said uh, in, in, in terms of the possibility of having some sort of uh, uh, way in Berlin that, uh, and, and, and I realise this isn't you know rocket science or anything like that, but in having some way where you could have uh, representatives of the uh, dynamic coalitions in a in a room with nameplates, if if, if you like, uh, so people that can't necessarily make the uh, individual sessions that the dynamic coalitions uh, can uh, can have can come along and talk to. Uh, you know, representatives and uh, perhaps sign up or uh, try and understand better what the dynamic coalitions uh, do. So it, it, it was just, just, just a thought. I'm sure other people have better ideas, but it, it, it's, it's just a way of... of, of uh, and this doesn't obviously replace the dynamic coalition having a meeting. It's just a way of being able to reach out to people beyond that, that particular session. Uh, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Nigel. I think those were all good comments, both as they kind of relate to sort of DC activities um, integrating into the program and a little bit with respect to some of the main sessions. Um, I think what we need to do is to ask the DCs, there's two, two requests from the DCs um, and similar requests from the NRIs as well, and that's for some individual sessions and then for a main session. Um, the difference between a main session and any other workshop session is it's translated or interpreted. I'm sorry. It's interpreted. Um, that's the main difference. And it's in potentially a larger room, but I'm not even sure that's true in, um, in Berlin at this, at this venue. Um, and, when I, and I say that every time because I, I think we overload the main session a little bit. Um, and if we could have a conversation um, with the DCs, and frankly the same conversation when we come to we think we need a main session on X, I think we need to understand what is X going to accomplish? What is that main session going to accomplish? What's the purpose? And I think there could be several purposes. It could certainly be advancing the work. In some purposes it might be, I mean, advancing the issue within the community. In some issues it might be supporting the activity themselves, better supporting the the. DC activities so they can go do X. And I think that's a potentially a different sort of meeting. But I think we need to really ask, what are you looking for? What do you need and why? And not just, it's got a, you know, a label on it, so we ought to put it in some other stream. Um, we are trying to build a more cohesive focus program, and we want the program to really drive towards um, more concrete outputs. It's clear that a lot of the DCs and NRIs can very much be a, 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 you know, an, a part of that particular exercise. And at the same time, um, they do have other needs as well. And I think we need to try and find a way we can, can um, support them so that they can accomplish everything they, they are looking to. But again, I think maybe the takeaway there is that um, we all be open as we go through this conversation and we continue to focus on the fact that we're looking for a more cohesive focused agenda. Um, that actually drives to more concrete outputs um, and that we're um, at the same time respectful of all the work the community does and is looking to do in the background and that we're doing everything we can to support that work happening. Um, 
We have six minutes left. Yuta, Yuta, you have the floor. Yes, thank you, Lynn. I, I just wanted to pick up on uh, something that, that we had discussed yesterday in regard of the main sessions, and that was the idea that having the main sessions probably more to the end of the uh, IGF week, uh, and then uh, having main sessions based on the three main themes. So and the idea behind that was that uh, the workshops could then feed into these main sessions. And of course, dynamic coalition sessions could do so, so as well. So uh, I do think that what Ben Wallace said before, that the dynamic coalitions are already related with their work to the main themes. So it, I do think it will easily turn out that dynamic coalitions have to bring something forward to main sessions if we decide to have main sessions grouped around the three main themes. So that's my two cents to that. Thank you. Thank you, Yusa. Nicholas? <coughs> I would be completely remiss if I did not mention uh, tomorrow we will actually be um, in this room. Uh, we'll be having um, our working meeting for the DC um, uh, DC DNSI. So uh, for those that would like to join, um, please do so. Thank you very much. Um, and it's going to be from 1.30 to 2.30. Thank you. Um, we have just five minutes left. Um, when we come back after lunch, um, we'll start with the National Regional Youth IGF initiatives um, discussion. And we have gained a little bit of time, but we actually need that for the um, HLPDC and the other relevant initiatives and organizations um, set of discussions towards the end of the day. Um, the one item we haven't um, hit so far this morning was the workshop process review. <coughs> Um, which was um, a desire on the part of the MAG to hear from the community with respect to how the workshop submission process works and is. And um, I'm, I'm always game for trying to get that conversation started and seeing if we want to do something with it in the next five minutes. Um, if not, we can try and come back later, or we could um, pull the community separately as well. Again. I'm conscious that there aren't all that many non-MAG members in this particular session, and of course, MAG members should not have been submitting <laughs> workshops, <laughs> proposals. So your your particular perspective would be a little unique. Are there any comments um, from the community um, or any of the participants, either online or in the room, with respect to the the process? We have other opportunities to do the stock taking as well. That's always a part of the stock taking a little bit later in the process because it's not just the submission process, of course. It's the entire process and it's the kind of selection of the workshops and um, organization of the workshops and how that's supported as well that forms part of the stock taking. Well, and maybe we could even um, separately for the workshop group, working, working group that worked on the workshop <laughs> review and evaluation process, um, I wonder if it would be possible to send a survey or a poll or set something up online while it's fresh in individuals' minds just to those people that submitted the proposals. We'll have probably 300 or 400, I'm guessing, from past years. If there was a way to make it known that there was actually a poll or a survey in terms of, you know, what was your impression of the workshop submission process? What could have been more clear? Um, what should be changed? Um, while it's still fresh, um, that could be, frankly, a more fruitful way to get some feedback on the on the process. Is that something the working group could could consider and say it's a good idea or it's a terrible idea? <laughs> I, I don't see uh, I don't see any volunteers from the working group to answer that question. To be honest, I'm I'm not sure uh, how much uh, people who have just filled in the whole form and waiting for the decision to be made upon their proposal whether they are ready to fill in another survey. So I, I'm a little bit reluctant about that. I I do see it it could be a good idea, but. I don't know how many people would really feel 
they have the time, uh, and if they feel they need to do that to get an acceptance of that proposal, that would be a complete misleading uh, message. So. Okay. No, that, I mean, that's fair. I mean, I would ask the working group to think, though, about how would you like to get feedback from the community on the workshop process, and at what point is a sensible, both a sensible time and a sensible mechanism. I think there should be a concrete, a, a concrete outreach to them. Um, with that, we're right on time for lunch, so we'll break here and then come back at 3 o'clock. We do have um, we had another busy session, so we'll come back. Um, we'll start with the NRIs, and um, in fact, if my math is correct here, we should have an hour for that discussion, which would be a nice um, point of time, and then we'll move to the um, strategic con contributions. Um, and so we had requests from about six organizations to make sh some interventions, and then the HLPDC is at 5, right? No, I think so. So um, thank you, everybody. Have a good lunch. Bye-bye.